because I can't see the Hello screen. and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 121, Active Game Nights. How to maintain your game group. I'm Sean, and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Moti. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Remember, we record these shows live every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop, and it would be awesome if you could join us. All right, tonight we've got a question from a longtime listener who's looking for advice on maintaining a regular game group and a regular game night, something that's harder than ever to do right now. After that, thanks to a recent birthday, I've finally gotten a copy of the Creepy Cellar expansion for Ghost Fighting Treasure Hunters, the best kids game of all times, and I'll be sharing my thoughts on that expansion. Next up, I've got something a little different for our show, uh, something that some of our fans and patrons have requested, which is more digital gaming content. So I've got a review of a digital game, a new roguelike deck building game from Richard Garfield, the man behind Magic the Gathering. Once we get to the week in review, I don't have much here, uh, just a bit more on Ghost Fighting Treasure Hunters and some digital gaming to talk about. Well, I've also been playing digital games. I did get in a couple of games of masks. Nice. Welcome to the suggestion box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. First up, a comment on the topic of great historically themed board games to appeal to historical miniature war gamers and history buffs. Phil Hatfield writes, I would also highly suggest Lewis and Clark, The Expedition, also Empire's Age of Discovery. All right, those are two games I haven't personally played. I have good heard good things about both of them, though. So thanks for those suggestions, Phil, and as usual, be sure to toss links in the show notes. Dave Killingsworth, the designer of the Robotech games, commented on our Crisis Point review to say, you earn the tokens as you play the cards. All right, so anyone who watched our review or read my written review of um, Crisis Point knows there was some ambiguity we had during where for where the battle tokens came from when playing the game. Sadly, this comment from Dave didn't actually help me. So I understand you get a number of battle tokens based on the battle rating of the card. And when you play it, you play a card with a five, you get five battle tokens. You get the tokens right away. I get that. That part's totally clear in the rule book. What... I'm confused by our cards that then have you assign tokens to other cards. Do those come from those tokens you just got when you played the card or do they come from the generic pool? For example, I'm not going to name the specific card, but there is a card in the game that has a five battle token rating. So as soon as I play the card, I get five battle tokens. Then the card says place three battle tokens on non-adjacent enemy cards. Well, where do those three come from? That's the part that's ambiguous. Do they come from the five I just got when I played the card? Or are these three new tokens I'm going to take from the pool in place? So I did reply uh, similar to this to Dave's comment, but I haven't heard anything back from him. So hopefully we'll have a more clear answer next week. And when I do get an answer, what I will be doing is going back and editing at least the written review to put in the official answer. And I'll probably put a comment in the show notes for the YouTube version. The next comment comes from our Alien the Role-Playing Game starter set and comes from the Electric Dreams on YouTube. Great review and breakdown. Had the core book and screen already, picked up the starter recently for a sweet price off eBay, but sadly missing the dice. Oh, sorry to hear the set. You got a set without dice because uh, those dice are not cheap. Uh, we actually had a big conversation about them in our Discord, and they're actually a big reason that I think the price point on the box set is actually really good and makes it very affordable for what you get because of including those dice. So I do hope you got a really good deal in that case, Electric Games. Next up, a question on our master list of tabletop gaming podcasts that wasn't just a request to add another cast to the list. Terrence Brown wrote, One of my regrets about 2020-2021 is that I haven't been able to play as many board games as I used to. There's always something special about meeting up with friends and enjoying a few good hours of craziness together. So the next best thing has, for me has been to listen, try and listen to gaming podcasts as much as possible. So needless to say, I'm overjoyed to see this post from the fine folk at Tabletop Bellhop. Well, thanks for that comment, Terrence. Um, I love reading things like this. What makes what's 
it's what makes maintaining those lists worth it for me. I, I love I love it, getting the positive feedback. Um, just in case anyone isn't aware of these, uh, one of the things we offer over at the Tabletop Bellhop blog is a series of lists of cool gaming content. Now, these are all located just below our main logo on the second menu, menu bar, just under where it says Tabletop Bellhop. And there are multiple ones of these. So I've got a list of tabletop crafters on Etsy with all kinds of cool gaming bling. I got a list of tabletop gaming Patreon projects um, from all kinds. I've got mappers to adventure writers. There's a list of Twitch streamers, including great shows like The Misdirected Mark and Gaming and BS. We got a list of gaming YouTube channels like The Dice Tower and Watch It Played. And finally, a list of gaming podcasts with shows like ours, actual plays, roundtable discussions, and a lot more. Now, I am always looking for more content to add to these lists. So if your show, channel, whatever you have, page, your Patreon isn't on the list, or I missed one of your personal favorites that aren't on the list, just hit me up via the blog or email, and I'll get it added. We'll also toss a link to each of these lists into our show notes. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. Tonight, we've got a question for long, from longtime fan of the show, Emmett O'Brien. The question, I don't always get to listen to the podcast right away. I just listened to the podcasts on game weight and competition, and you asked for more philosophical questions, so here goes. Getting and keeping a group active and regular is probably the problem that gamers face. There are so many things that can trump game night, Often the main causes are important responsibilities like childcare, work, and relationships. So are there tricks you've used to mitigate these factors? Do you use any techniques to build excitement around game night so that people want to show up more? Assuming that not all players are required, do you think a larger group has more of these problems or fewer? I weirdly get the feeling that when one person doesn't show up, it seems to give license to others not to show. And have mm. you seen this happen? Obviously, this is a really tough problem to crack, and I don't expect a solution, but any sage advice is appreciated. Wow, well, thanks so much for the detailed question, Emmett. Um, Emmett's one of the people I miss seeing at cons. You usually run into him a couple times a year. Um, as I think everyone is aware, we don't always get to people's questions as soon as we get them, right? Uh, we have a backlog of questions. I actually have an Excel file with a, a surprisingly large number of questions in it. And the order we go in has a lot to do with what we've talked about recently, what games we've been playing, what other questions we have, and honestly, what we feel like talking about at the time. Due to this, we actually got this question before any of us had ever heard of COVID-19. So when Emmett wrote us, he was talking about the difficulty of getting a game group together without the added complexity of not being able to game in person. I thought it would be interesting to talk about this particular question now, a year into quarantine for most of us, due to the complexities that have been added due to the quarantine, the lockdowns and not being able to play face to face, or even when you do play face to face, having to wear masks or be so far apart. Now, I do still want to talk about your regular game group on an average year and an average game night, because I do believe we will get back there at some point. But I also want to talk to you about what you can do now that we're all stuck gaming from our own homes. So many people working on so many solutions to this, we almost certainly can't name them all. So as always, drop us a line if you've got some other winning solutions to this real world problem with or without pandemic. Yeah, we're always looking, we, we can't cover it all, but hopefully we do have some sage advice. I think Emmett worded it for Emmett tonight. So, all right, we're going to start off with some role playing. We're going to all imagine that things are normal and that getting together for a game night just means heading over to your friend's place or the local game store, possibly having some food together and something you can do regularly, uh, whether that's at a cafe or pub at your own home or at a friend's place. So right now we're imagining everything's normal. Everything's uh, 19 or 2019 <laughs> in, the, in the house tonight. So what I want to do is start with that. So we're pretending there, there, there's no pandemic right now. It's, it's regular. You get together every Friday or you get together on weekends. So Emmett's got a bunch of different things in this question. So he's got a bunch of different parts to his question. It's, it's not just one overall question, but different segments. And I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to break it down to sections just to make sure we cover everything that Emmett's asking. So I want to start with this. So this is to quote Emmett. There are so many things that can trump game night. Often the main causes are important responsibilities like childcare, work, and relationships. 
so what I want to point out here is what he notes that they are important responsibilities. I, there are a number of very valid reasons to, for someone to cancel or for you to cancel or for someone to skip out on game night. Because most importantly, I think everyone needs to realize, and some people tend to forget this, they take their hobby very seriously. Like here we are, I, I like I make a living for it, from it. And I still have to get it stuck in my head that this is, it's a game. It's, it's meant to be a pastime. It's meant to be fun. This is not a job. Well, for most people, um, this is not, not, it, it's just something you do to have fun. It's something that should be giving you spoons. It's something that should be enjoyable. It should be something that's part of your self care. It should be a way to pass time and needs to be thought of that way. It needs to be thought of as a hobby, as a fun leisure activity, not as a burden or something you have to do. And because of that, Almost every excuse is a valid excuse. There are going to be very few reasons to cancel on a game night that's not valid. We're all adults. We all have responsibilities, whether that's kids or not, jobs, uh, needing to take out the garbage, do the laundry, whatever. Yes, you may probably can reschedule that for a better night or whatever, and there are workarounds, but there's just there's things we have to do. There, there are obligations we have that are way more important than getting together with your friends and doing a leisure activity. Yeah, and I think a lot of this has to do with the first part of, uh, of or part of his first sentence there, and that is game night. Mm -hmm. And what those words mean uh, can really shape a lot of how people are taking, how seriously people are taking your event. Is it a friendly open thing? Is it an open post on Facebook or Twitter that invites people by one night of the week? Uh, if you're looking for a, great, uh, a regular group, it should be a regularly pre-scheduled event yeah. that all parties have agreed to. Um, and, and taking it seriously from a scheduling point of view helps other people take it seriously as an attending point of view. Yep. So that leads me to my next point that once you have scheduled a game night, once you have sat down and you made a game group and it is something regular, people do also have to realize this is an obligation. So this is the opposite side. While I'm saying pretty much any excuse is valid, you should be doing everything you can to stick to that obligation. Like I like to think of it as you're part of a sports team, right? Your team gets together for practice on Wednesdays and you play the game on Saturday night. If you don't show up, you're letting down the entire team. I feel game groups should feel the same way or as important as that. If you don't make it to game night, there is a good chance you're letting people down. Now, especially if you have a small group, if you're looking at like an RPG group of five players who get together to play D&D &D, and it's the kind of campaign where if one player is missing, you can't play, that's an even stronger obligation. Or if you're playing Gloomhaven with a group of four players and you need the same group of four players to continue your campaign if one of them can't make it, it's an obligation. Now, some of that stems from my personal, uh, I don't know, vengeance is the wrong word, but hatred of the fact that places of work and sometimes other family members and mainly non-gamers don't tend to think of gaming this way where you know bob gets to have thursday nights off and never has to work afternoons because he plays baseball but i can't have saturdays off because i run events at the local game store where to me they're at the same level they're, they're both obligations that I've signed up where I am letting down other people if I can't show up. So that's why I like to bring in the sports analogy because a lot of other people, it seems like people give leeway to people who play sports. Whereas I think playing a game is just as important. But at the same time, even pros have to miss out on games sometimes. Yes. So again, there are reasons that you can't make it right. Yeah. Uh, there are factors that are completely legitimate, even if you have established a regular Mm -hmm. game group that everyone has agreed to yeah i think the important thing is take it seriously realize it's an obligation but also realize it's an obligation to do a leisure activity so there's a fine balance there like saying you can't make it because you didn't do laundry on monday and you forgot is is pretty lame right like just make sure you do your laundry on non-game night like make make arrangements but then if your kid has parent teacher interviews that night well come on of course go to parent teacher interviews so the next thing Emmett mentions are is, are there tricks you've used to mitigate these factors so to not have people cancel? 
So while you can't avoid necessary absences or emergencies, there are some things I've found over the years running multiple events. I've been running events in the Windsor area. For anyone that doesn't know my bona fides, I've been running events in Windsor since 2002. Um, events with attendance going anywhere from three to 75 people, um, as well as assisting, helping out with cons and things like that and volunteering at cons. So I'm definitely used to having regular game nights. Now, in addition to those public plays, I have various game groups that have been coming to my house for years, uh, whether that's RPG groups or just a regular board game group that gets together every week. So just that's where my background's coming from. And these are things I've found you can do. And the one Sean already mentioned a couple times here is consistency, right? Uh, a regular time at a regular place with a regular schedule that everyone is well aware of. I think that is probably the number one recommendation. It shouldn't be we get together sometime each week to play or we get together Saturday if we can. It should be we get together Saturday night starting at six and we play until at least 11. And everyone knows that and everyone knows that Saturday at six is game night. Your family knows everyone else knows you can let your work know you tell your friends. I'm, I'm busy that night. Sorry. That's what I do on Saturday night. So whatever night I said it was earlier. I might have forgot what night I said. You never want to be wishy washy. You'll never play. You'll never actually get the group together if it's wishy-washy. Heck, we have this problem now. We've been trying to do games with a couple of our Patreon patrons. And we keep saying, yeah, yeah, we should get together with them. And then we write them, hey, do you want to get together? Yeah, let's get together. But we never go, you know what? This Saturday at 9, we're going to play. When we do that, we get together and we play. And it works. Now, if we set it up as a regular schedule and we go, nah, maybe this is what we need to do, is go the first Sunday of every month is when we do it then maybe we'd be a little more consistent. As it is, it's like, okay, we're going to do it on Sundays. And we play more often now that we say we do it on Sundays. And we have a set time. We're going to play Sundays at nine, but it's not every Sunday. So then you get the, oh, I thought we weren't playing this week and I, maybe we are playing next week. And now, oh, it's this Saturday. I thought it, you have all those problems. So you want a regular schedule. Yeah, absolutely. And, and there's lots of ways to do that. Now, when you, once you have a regular schedule, it's important to, you know, put it in someone's calendar, whether it's in your Zoom calendar or in your Outlook or, or in your Google calendar on your phone, mm -hmm. put it in, get it in everyone's calendar. So there's a reminder so that when they look at their calendar, they don't say, oh yeah, sure, Bob, I'm free to go out for drinks on Saturday when they should know that every Saturday from four till eight, mm -hmm. you play Doom. Whatever. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> totally fair. See, it's definitely harder. Like when it's weekly, it's easy. It's easy to remember when it's every Friday. Where it's hard is when it's every other month or it's every third week or it's the fourth Friday. And that's that's the problem we had here in Windsor with the local gaming events is it was set up. So it was at one game store the first Saturday of the month, a different game store the second Saturday of the month, a different game store the third Saturday of the month and at a cafe on the fourth Saturday of the month. But then when there was that sixth, fifth Saturday, everyone was confused because they wanted to go back to the first rotation and it was always a mess and I, I spent so much time over communicating it um which does lead to using tools to give people reminders as sean's i put it in a calendar there's also like things like facebook events right nowadays people are kind of wishy-washy on facebook a lot of people have left it a lot of people still like it it's still to me one of the best places to organize locals um especially to get new locals out to events but if you're looking at your regular game group you might want to use something different. Um, there's also Meetup as another example for public events. Although or, Meetup has had some pricing issues and things, so I'm not sure. If yeah, they are... I don't. They're still around because I yeah. keep getting invited to stuff, which <laughs> I'm like, um, there's a pandemic. What are you trying to invite me to go play Robotech in Detroit for? <laughs> Maybe they're still getting together. I don't know. But I, I think there's there should be something, right? Now, another thing that I think you need to do to increase your odds of people setting up is setting the expectations. So in addition to the date and the time, oh, that's a, before I get to that, where is very important. I kind of alluded to this. It was at one game store and then the other game store and then the cafe that confuses people, right? So it's really easy if it's at your place every Monday, but if it rotates, make sure everyone knows that schedule, that it's at my place the first Saturday of the month, it's at Sean's place the second Saturday of the month, and it's at Kevin's place the third Saturday of the month. And we rotate just to share the responsibility of playing host, which is a great way to do things, actually. And it's actually a great way so that one person doesn't have all the burden and one person who doesn't get burnt out. So that's actually another way you can mitigate that is by rotating the responsibilities. But what those responsibilities are need to be set, right? You need to pre-plan. You need to have expectations. Who's bringing the games? 
do you just when you're at Sean's place you should play Sean's games or at Mo's place you play Mo's games when you're at Kevin's place you play whatever game he just won from whatever draw he entered like how many games are you going to get played like do you show up and during game night we're going to play three games we're going to play a filler and two medium weight games or you're going to play a big epic Twilight Imperium style game are you going to play light games is there going to be a filler to start is it going to be one group playing one game or 12 different groups and free for all everyone plays what they want like all of that and all of these are valid i'm not saying one way is better the important part is to sit down and decide this ahead of time what is your plan for each each session and does this change is it the same every week is it just open gaming free for all or is it we always start off with a light fit, light game that's less than 50 minutes to get everyone talking then we play a one and a half one to a two hour game and then we bring out the euro game that takes two hours and it's like that every week or is it just hey who brought what this week and and knowing that can actually make a huge difference to people who are or maybe on the edge of showing up because mm -hmm. maybe they have something at 10 o'clock and they could be there from eight till 10, but they really need to run at 10 because their mm -hmm. babysitter is leaving. And if they know you're getting into Twilight Imperium, they're yeah. just going to skip out. But if they know they can get a game or two in before they leave, they're more likely to show up. And I think we'll get into later how, you know, showing up at all and not showing up, you know, changes the, uh, the situation and the dynamics. But yes, that can make a big difference if they know in advance whether or not there there's going to be some shorter games or if it's mm -hmm. going to be a, a big slog right and then also knowing um how many people are showing up like what like what what is the expectation is it is it one game group right is it you and your your four friends who get together on mondays is going to be a very different from if it's not right so again if it's just your home group it doesn't really apply but if you're doing a public event People need to know if there's going to be other people there to play with. Where that's most important is, is um, I, I don't want loner to be the, the bad word here, like as in a poor person, but like the single person showing up to play games, are they going to be able to find a table to sit down and play with? Right. Like, whereas if you go with a group of friends, you can play with each other. But like, if you're the, the person looking for people to play with, are there going to be people there to play with? Or are you going to show up and there's the same group of five people who always play the same game in the corner playing that game and you're sitting there going, oh, what do I want to play? And again, that's something that should be talked about ahead of time and is going to um, help mitigate. Right. Because if that single person shows up and there's nothing from the play, you won't expect them to come back the next week. No, absolutely not. And uh, then other things is make sure there's some way for people to let you know to cancel that they're going to cancel because that'll mitigate it, right? You don't want to be there on game night wondering who's going to show up. You should know before showing up to game night who's going to be there. Now, again, a big public event with 30, 40 people, this isn't as important. But I don't want to find out Monday night when I've got my DM screen set up and my miniatures out and I've already drawn my map, the two of my players aren't going to show up. Right. So there should be a way you need to provide a way for people to do that. And that should be part of your um, your your table rules. Right. Your unwritten written or unwritten could go either way rules or your social contract of what do you do when you're going to cancel and having that in place again ahead of time can mitigate the fact that people. Well, if it doesn't mitigate the fact that people do or don't cancel, it at least mitigate the effect of people yep. canceling. Uh, and again, you know, I've got a tool for for uh, or or issues recently for setting up the game group in the first place. So in my online play of masks, I'm actually taking in players from all over the place, uh, all mm -hmm. different time zones. Uh, one of our party is in GMT. So five hours off wow. uh, and, and finding a group of players who were going to be able to connect at a certain regular time was tough. Uh, but we found when to meet that's when the number two meet.com, which is a free site where a group can set up a, a little schedule planner and everyone can fill in their availability. Um, and then it just shows up for everybody and you can see, oh, well, this person, these people are available this time. Oh, well, you know, out of the, the six people who were, tr were trying to get together, we found four people and these two nights a week that mm -hmm. every, all of those are available. So unfortunately, those other two people probably aren't going to be able to join our group, but we've got a solid gaming group of four people who can now meet every two weeks. Nice. Um, and so it was a great way to just to, you know, not be asking questions after questions after mm -hmm. questions. It was just, look, go to this calendar, fill in when you're available, and we're going to pick the maximum party size that I'm, you know, the, the DM is available to to run at. Yep. Um, yeah, there's the, that one meme I love with all the people that are like, 
who are we they're like board gamers what do we do we play games when do we play monday no wait i'm not free monday no tuesday i can't play saturday and you never get the group together right yeah that is such a common thing and has been for years but there are a lot of tools out there i remember um Evil John, who I don't think is in the chat room tonight, had sent me something. It was like xi.com or something. Yeah, but I there's, don't a, ma- there's a bunch of them. And this this one was just a quick little free That sounds thing. free and easier and, than and this other one. And it was literally one. just drag, and, you know, drag up and down over the hours of each day wow. you're available for yep. the next month. And, and you know, we built a party out of that. We, we, we knew not nice. everyone was going to meet. So we grabbed some extra people and, and mm-hmm. found it all out. And it worked uh, fantastic. So that's something worth adding in here. I know we're pretending the world's all fine, but people have been doing online gaming for a long time, but that is something else that needs to be communicated when communicating time and place. Remember to include time zones. Yep. <laughs> that is That has become a very important thing nowadays that people don't always think of. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, do you have any other tips or tricks you can think of to mitigate people I really, not attending or not getting the notice? Open communication is, is yeah. the biggest thing. If open you can, communication if you can and sure... scheduling. Yeah, if you can make sure everyone is aware and on board, agreed in advance, uh, it just goes so much further. All right, moving on to Emmett's next section of his, his, his nice long question for us. Do you use any techniques to build excitement around game night so that people want to show up more? Um, my number one first thing I thought of that popped in my head right away is theme your game nights. Um, we have a lot more success. This is me thinking about public play events in Windsor, Ontario, having a theme to each event, whether that's one specific game. So it's, we are going to demo this. We are going to be showcasing this game. We're going to have multiple copies of the game. If you want to learn how to play this game, show up tonight, plus bring whatever you want. We also have open gaming. You can play whatever you want. You can play our demo copies. You can do whatever you want to do. But we're going to have an expert here showing off this game, right? So that's one way to theme it. We've also had the, ah, it's pirate night, and everyone brings pirate games. When we've done that, without asking anyone, we had people show up in cosplay. That's when I knew that worked. When we had people show up dressed as pirates, I'm like, okay, that one, that was awesome. We did superhero nights. We did racing nights. We did sports nights. We did medieval nights and so on. Just something to add just a little bit more fun to the game. Plus, it also helps relieve some of that analysis paralysis of what should we play, right? It, it limits your focus because that is another problem with game nights that, that I kind of mentioned with the pre-planning, set the expectations. What are you going to play? Knowing what kinds of games are going to be there is a big part of it. And knowing that you're going to be playing pirate games tonight. So we're going to have some Libertalia and some Black Fleet and I don't know pirate games. What's that? Forgotten Waters is the hot run right now. Everyone's going nuts for that game. The latest Coded Chronicles game, right? That's what we're going to show off this night. So I think themes are a great way to want people to show up, right? So it's not just, it's open gaming. You're not just showing up going, oh, I'm showing up to play games. I don't know what games yet. We'll see what games are there. It's no, no, I'm going to pirate night. We're going to go play some pirate games or I'm going to fantasy night. I'm going to be a knight tonight. And you know what? This this matters just as much with an RPG group as it does with a board game group. Mm. The difference being with an RPG group, it is on essentially the DM or the party, depending on the on the style of play, if you're playing a more narrative game, to keep the game running. If you are going to be playing, you know, Dungeons and Dragons from 8 p.m. until midnight, you want to play Dungeons and Dragons for at least three and a half hours. Yes. You don't want to play Dungeons and Dragons for an hour and a half and chat and do this and that mm-hmm. and talk about your week, the rest of it. I as a, because that's going to get boring. You you want people to want to come because they know there is going to be the adventure. Mm-hmm. They are going to get what they are going for, which, you know, whether it's a board game or, you know, a, a, a type of board game, or if it's an RPG, you want to keep them engaged for the time you have scheduled. Or maybe you're scheduling the wrong amount of time. You know, yeah. that could be the problem as well. Maybe you're scheduling a four hour session, but as a GM, you really aren't prepping four hours of gameplay. You've really only got about two hours of content mm-hmm. and the players are, are kind of roaming and, and, and hemming and hawing a lot. Well, tighten that up, make it a two hour session or prep for four, whichever yeah. you're capable of. That's, that's fine, but make sure it works for everybody because if people aren't doing what you they, they want, they're going to be less likely to show up. Oh, yeah, you know what? I'm, I'm going to miss this week. You know, that's okay. We didn't do all that much last week. We, no one will mind. So kind of to build on that, if you are having a problem where you're spending half your game night socializing instead of gaming, 
maybe you should plan a different type of event, right? Make, make your night more than just gaming. Make it more of a social experience, right? Schedule it so that you are socializing. So you're socializing, but but before or after gaming. So it's separated. And everyone knows this, right? It's it's we are getting together to play DD from six till ten, but we know from six till seven, we're gonna we're gonna shoot the the bull. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna chit chat and talk about what we've been doing and what who visited their your Animal Crossing Island and what you watched on Netflix last week. And we're gonna sit down and maybe maybe we'll have some snacks and some food or some drinks before or again after, right? We're gonna we're gonna play D D. We're playing from six till nine. I want everyone focused. We're gonna focus on the game, but right at nine o'clock, we're as close to it as we can. We're gonna call it and then we're gonna decompress. We're gonna sit back. Now, D D is probably a bad example in that, but this is especially important for any RPGs with bleed, right? Any games where you are gonna get deeply emotionally involved, you want that cool down time and that return to normality at the end of the game. So that cool down at the end. Plus, try to keep the gaming more like yes you want to be focused on the games but it is a social experience right you are playing with friends so things like snacks food drinks are all part of the 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 allure of it now again expectations is the host providing all of this do you bring your own are you ordering in all this should be determined ahead of time you're going to the local game store is there a place on site to buy food can you order in pizza all this should be determined ahead of time and you should know what exactly you're doing but one of the ways to keep people involved is to reinforce that social aspect right so another example that i would love to do if i could afford it is before every game session get together with my group and go for dinner or after either way either i want to go sit at a restaurant have a pint of beer sit and eat some pizza and talk about what happened last week and what we're going to do this week or if it's a board game start talking about the game like hey we're going to be playing twilight imperium tonight it won this award and here's the kind of gameplay i'm not going to teach you to play here but here's here's how the game works or this is where we decide what to play here's the seven games i was thinking of playing tonight what has you guys excited what would you like to play or again the op do it as the opposite you you sit down you have a great rpg session then you all go to dinner you're all sit together and you're like all right what worked what was your favorite part what did well all right what didn't you like what do you think of this NPC? Oh, remember when you made this rule and that wasn't the rules and I came up with this ruling? What'd you think of that rule? I think that's a way to get people more excited about game night because it's a little bit, it's going to get the social people in your group more excited, right? The people who are out there to hang out with friends more than they are to play games are going to then enjoy playing the games even more because they're going to get that social feed. Yeah, and, and uh, that's a great uh, time if you're doing RPGs. Uh, take on, you do your, your Wishes and Stars or your Roses mm -hmm. and Thorns do some of those 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 cleanup after event uh, moments, you know, have a, have a piece of paper or, your, or a note app on your phone to keep track of what people are saying. But, uh, you know, take it away from the table and, and get people talking and you mm -hmm. might actually get a, a better feedback for your wishes and stars and things uh, in that setting rather than everyone is still kind of hyped up after that game and, or, you know, mm -hmm. whatever happened during the game and aren't thinking about the whole event they're thinking about that last encounter that really kind of mm -hmm. you know did whatever now another tip i have to help build excitement is to extend the game night past game night right so what do you do during the week to get people excited uh use online tools uh if you've got uh, a discord or a facebook group or even just emails between your friends if you've got a, an email news list or a, an ongoing chat you know like a chat with your 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 whole game group in there the hey remember when we played this oh remember when dave pulled that awesome move off and totally messed over deanna at the end of the game and hey what do you guys want to play next week or oh i just got a copy of white star i'm really looking forward to playing this what do you guys think you want to try some white star on the weekend right just keeping the buzz and the excitement about game night going during the week or weeks or months depending on what your thing is again for some reason i default in my head to a weekly game night but this isn't necessarily about a weekly game night whether it's two weeks or a month between and actually if you do have a month between i think this is even more important to try to keep that buzz and excitement going. Absolutely. And, and for me, um, Discord has been an invaluable tool for this sort of thing. Uh, again, for, for, for a masks game, we have a dedicated jabber channel, just, just garbage where people can chat. And all throughout the week, even though we only game two nights a week for four hours a session, people are always in that channel 
chatting and, 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 you know, they get home from work and, you know, Hey, how was everyone's night going? You know, whatever. Mm -hmm. Uh, and keeping that content going. Um, and then we even have a, a separate channel. We actually have a, a, an out of chat, out of character channel for game nights so that people can still chat during right. game night, but not interrupt the game. There's a chance, mm -hmm. there's a separate channel for RP and there's a separate channel for out of character conversations. Um, and, and keeping that information flow and that friendliness and that banter between players mm -hmm. and people uh, is really important to keep the strength of the group and the, the strength of the group bond. And again, that group bond is what's going to help people to keep coming back. So next up, uh, he was asking, assuming that not all players are required, do you think a larger group has more of these problems or fewer? All right. In general, the larger the group, the less impact one or more players canceling is going to affect the entire group. And in general, I honestly think the bigger the group, the better, if you have the space for it, right? Like you don't necessarily want a huge group for your game room. Uh, the more people, the more chance everyone not only has someone to play with, right, but can find someone they want to play with, which is another issue that kind of comes up when you get big groups of players together and those players can find a game they can agree on playing right um unless you're limited by space right and, and again role-playing groups this is difficult there, there's a fine line from making your group big enough so that if a couple people cancel it's good enough to play to you have to be able to host it when everyone shows up and that can really ruin a game right i i remember running a warhammer game with eight players because on average three canceled and i was so used to three canceling that we usually played with five well, one week, all eight showed up, and I'm like, oh, my God, that was not a good session. Like, there's just – there's so much crunch in that game and passing the dice around. It was like we should have played something else. But then looking at just a generic game group, right, so for so board game group or whatever, the problem you're going to have with large groups is – other problems, right? Not not game night cancellation problems. The problems you're going to run into are different player personalities, competitiveness levels, um, issues of social um, social issues. We'll just say uh, if there's alcohol involved, that one or two gamers that have a few too many, right? Like all of this are gay group problems. That the bigger the group, the more you're going to see. None of this, though, has an impact on maintaining a regular game night, and these are topics we've covered in other podcasts, and I suggest you listen to those to really get the details on how to deal with player problems, but as far as I'm concerned, when you're trying to get a steady game group, you want as big as possible for something public, right? If you're playing at a local store, uh, a, a cafe, a pub, like up to their capacity, obviously, for a personal game group, that's your call. How many people can you host in your basement? I am perfectly happy with 12 people showing up as long as they're perfectly cool with splitting into two groups and playing two games at six. Now, where I have a problem is when we get to eight players and they all insist we have to play a game together. I'm not a big fan of most of the big party games. But I set that expectation. I'm like, the only time I do that is New Year's. I'll, I'll put up with, um, we have a couple friends who always show up for New Year's. I always want to start the event with playing something together. I'm like, all right, fine. We'll play a couple rounds of code names or Camel Up or something. And yeah, there you go, Scott. We played our game together. Now we're going to split up, all right? I'm going to play some three and four player games and actually have some more fun and not just sit, wait for everyone else to do something. Yeah, it's, it's, it's important to, to be prepared, like Mo said with that Warhammer game. You know, what are you going to do if everybody shows up, yeah. the last thing you want is the people getting the idea that it's better if not everyone shows up yeah, and deciding that, oh, it's just not a big thing, right? I know there's going to be six other people there. So if I don't show up, it won't hurt anything. And I can, I can make plans on that night if someone asks because hmm. they've been there that one night when everybody showed up and it was a disaster. So if you've got 12 people in your group, make sure that if 12 people show up, 12 people have fun. Yeah, I totally agree. All right, well, next up, uh, he says, I weirdly get the feeling that when one person doesn't show up, it seems to give license to others to not show. Have you seen this happen? Uh, this is definitely a thing, but it's not a good thing. This is, this is usually a good sign that there's something not quite right in your game group, whatever that happens to be. When this happens, it often means there are people in the group who are only showing up due to a sense of obligation that they signed up. So they're going to come and they're not coming for the joy of playing with others. Seeing someone else cancel gives them an out. 
right? So like, oh, I can cancel guilt-free because, well, Sean's not going to come. So now I can say I'm not going to come. I don't have to go now. You tend to see this when people have found something else they'd rather do. Um, Whatever that happens to be, Uh, that could be anything. It could be a TV series they want to watch, a new hobby they've gotten into, another group they want to hang out with. uh, They've become infatuated with another person they've got a date whatever um there's something else they want to do other than game one other issue you can run into and this one's a little bit a sticky one is introverts uh people who just aren't always comfortable in groups and they really they may really love going to your gaming session but they have to force themselves to do it because groups of people are problematic Uh, And that's something that you need to sort of work with outside of the group. But do be aware because they're probably the person who is going to take that opportunity to check out. If, If they see that opportunity, they will because, you know, it uses up a lot of spoons to go to those events. I mean, they have fun, but it's really draining at the same time. Uh, And being one of those people myself, (laughs) I can speak from experience. If, if there's an out, it may well get taken. So the, the issue here, well, I'm not issue, but the hard part here is dealing with it, right? What, what do you do when you notice that every time someone cancels, Sean also cancels? You're like, oh, I, the, the main thing is find out if they still want to be part of the group. And there's the thing with Sean. And we have a, a friend, Steve, I'm not going to say a last name, who I think is in the same boat. Because Steve has missed more sessions than anyone else in any of my game groups ever. And after he misses about four, and every time about four go by, I get a hold of Steve. I'm like, Steve, do you still want to be part of the group, right? Do you still want to play? Are you still interested? Do you still want to be on the invite list? And every time she's like, oh, yeah, I love it. I can't believe it. Oh, man, I had so much fun the last time we played. I'm looking forward to the next time we play. It'll be great. And then Steve cancels again. So ask that question, right? Like, hey, like, like for all you know, maybe something's going on you don't know about right? Like it may not have anything to do with your game group, especially right now with what's going on in the world, whether that's the pandemic or unrest or social justice or the millions of things going on uh, in 2021, maybe the person just can't. And that is a valid excuse. So the hard part is that whole, you know, put on your adult pants, you know, I I hate kind of getting sick of that term. You hear it all the time. Put on, put on, put on the pants and ask the question, right? Like, Hey, I noticed you've been canceling on it. Do you actually want to be part of this game group? Like, we don't mind. If you have other things you'd rather do on Saturday nights, that's fine. Is Saturday night a problem? Maybe we can find another night, right? Like, it's having to have that conversation. Again, it's not easy to do. Um, Just see if you can do it. See if there's something wrong, right? Like, um, you want to try to, uh, and be ready to change, right? Like, do what you can to make the experience more fun for those people including many of the tips we already talked about. Maybe it's just boring. Maybe we don't have a regular schedule. Maybe I keep forgetting that it's on this week because one week, one time it's on Saturday and then it's on Thursday and then it's on Saturday again. What day do we play? It could be any of those problems as well. Yeah, and one other thing to be important is don't assume someone will be back if they just miss one night. Even if they have a good reason, make, just check in. Just be personable, check in, see if they're coming back. See if that, don't be confrontational, but you're trying to encourage people to come back. And the fact that you're wanted in a group can mm-hmm. help people want to return. Um, yeah. if, if everyone's just like, oh yeah, yeah, they missed it, whatever. And, and, and that's the end of it. That doesn't make me feel like I'm an important part of that group. But if one or two people reach out and say, hey, is everything okay? You weren't here on Monday. Are you coming next Monday? All of a sudden now I'm like, oh, mm-hmm. well, okay, maybe, maybe there is a good reason for me to come back. Maybe, maybe it is more important that I'm there than I was thinking it was. I will go back. All right. Do we have anything else for Emmett on a, on a regular game night? Can you think of anything else, any tips we can give him for if the world was a normal place and we could get, be getting together tomorrow to game, what could you do to make sure people showed up? I really, it comes down to communication and planning. And, yeah. and, and, and planning, planning the communication and communicating the planning. Um, yeah. that, that's it. Yeah. Keep things, try to keep things interesting, right? Mix it up. Uh, make sure someone's not doing all the work. That was something we didn't have in the notes that came up kind of in the middle of the discussion there that I think is important. Um, 
make sure like share the hosting abilities try to try to share the love if, if one person's doing all the work see what you can do to help out try to try to make sure no one gets burnt out that's that's one thing don't always play the same game even if you love Catan and play Catan all the time make a Catan group do that and go play Catan with your Catan group and that's it try to keep it together so since we pretty much covered the things Emmett brought up explicitly, what I want to do now is look at advice for maintaining a game group in tough times, uh, where we are now in the middle of a global pandemic and potentially any other tough times like a winter snow in, or I, I, I'm trying to think of other things that uh, this is kind of, I, everyone's used this term too much this year, unparalleled, but I can't really think of another example, but you know, when, when the bombs drop and we're living well, in I bunkers. Mean, different, <laughs> di different, different spaces. I mean, right now, the fact that I'm playing on discord has more to do with the, the necessary group of people I'm trying to find, uh, to bring together than yeah. the pandemic. Um, these people don't live near me. They w have never lived near me. Uh, I've, I've met them online and this has always been an online thing. Yep. It couldn't happen. Uh, it, or it would happen exactly the same in 2019 as it does in 2021. Yeah, that's true. For your your particular group, you'd be gaming online with these people either way. Exactly. So it, it doesn't, there's a lot of online uh, action that can happen and you can find a wider range of people uh, if you don't uh, limit it to in-person gaming. Yeah, very true. That, that has been a godsend to many people gaming online for being able to um, game with new people, to meet new people, to play in safer spaces because that's not something you can guarantee at a public play event necessarily. Hopefully the venue is doing something to protect their, their, their patrons, but I think everyone knows what I mean without getting into too much detail about that. So when talking about playing gaming events, when we're dealing with something like pandemic, like uh, first off, be even more forgiving of people canceling, right? Uh, people are dealing with a lot right now. Uh, things are not normal and not everyone is coping with that well. People are dealing with kids at home or kids going to school, becoming potential plague bearers, uh, working from home or working at work, but in the weird new environment with new restrictions and face shields and all and staying away from each other and not sharing the microwave. Um, you're, you're, uh, many people are dealing with loss of income. Um, and in general, just loss of regularity, loss of, of normality. While gaming can be a great escape from all of this, and self-care is very important, hobbies, though, should take an even lower level of importance over other things. I had, we, had a, we had a person cancel. We, we had to reschedule a, a, a game on Saturday, this last Saturday, because the person uh, had fallen while they were shoveling from the blizzard Oof. that hit their town. Um, and they were just too sore even to sit down and enjoy a game at the computer. So, God. I mean, th these things happen, right? It's no matter what you're going to do things will happen yeah and like i said with with, it, with things right now if someone's excuse is i just couldn't i would accept that fully right now like there's just so much going on now most of what we said above is going to still be completely true for gaming at, in tough times and during a pandemic um you still want consistency right you still if you, you still want to gear game group together, yes, okay, maybe for the first little while things kind of fell apart and we had to get used to the new normal, whatever you want to call it. But if you want to reestablish that group, you need to get that consistency back. You need to make it a steady game night. You need to set a time. You need to set a place, that place, whether that's we're going to get together on Zoom or we're going to meet up on Facebook chat or we're going to whatever it happens to be I, where you are. Maybe you can get together physically and play social distance games. As long as you got games again, don't share components and stuff like that. Again, we got a whole podcast recommending games. You could play six meters apart or two meters apart, six feet apart. If that's it, if it is getting together in public, uh, maybe outdoors is safer supposedly than indoors. Uh, if you're in Ontario right now, don't do that. This is all bad. You're not allowed to get together. <laughs> but whatever that is, set the consistency, right? Set the rules. And here's something we did miss earlier. You should have a backup plan. So if game nights at Moe's, 9 o'clock every Monday, and Moe's the one that has to cancel, there should be a backup plan. This is something that Jeff Seuss brought up in our a previous conversation about game night scheduling, um, where, where they have that set up. It's we rotate GMs and we write, play at the GM's home. But if one of the GMs isn't available, it's the next GM's in line's responsibility to take over the game. Like that's actually another thing that will keep people attending, right? So that there isn't the, 
oh, Mo canceled, but we don't play. And now as soon as you miss one week, that it seems to uh, going along with the once one person cancels, everyone cancels. Well, as soon as you miss one week, all of a sudden it becomes, well, we missed last week. I can miss this week too. Right. So again, consistency, just as important, if not more important nowadays. Um, again, we could do a better job on this. Now, I don't know your mask game. Is that have a set? We do. We have, we have yeah. two, two nights a week, four hour, four hour sessions are booked. Um, and, and, Generally, we've we've had you know aside from oh there was a blizzard and I threw my back out yeah um, we've 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 been good and, and stick to it um, the big thing for us is what Discord has allowed when it comes to the next port thing we're going to talk about which is pre planning um, mm-hmm. because we've got a server dedicated to our game um, and there's only five people on it uh, we've set up channels and and it's you know there's only five people but we still have ten channels wow. uh, because we've broken things up and you know images can all go into one spot and memes can all get buried mm-hmm. somewhere else. So if you don't, you don't want to see the meme, that's great. But if you want to be, keep track of that conversation, it hasn't been filled up by this week's funny memes. Cause those are somewhere else. Um, and then, you know, I've even got separate RP channels for when we split the party. Um, you know, if you're going to split the party, you want to be able to keep track of things. And uh, if, if the players want to not metagame, they can just not look in that channel and see what's mm-hmm. happening uh, you know, with the other parties or if they're, you know, if they're comfortable, they can, that's, that, that's fine. Um, we aren't, we aren't doing things in private. We are just doing things separately um, as, as you would at a table, uh, but right. with, a, you know, a, a slightly more digital firewall uh, between. Right. So yeah, do the, the pre-planning is just as important, right? Again, what game are we playing? When are we playing? Who's bringing the game? Who's going to be the one to set up the game and put their camera on it so everyone else can see it? Who's going to... Have you all downloaded Tabletop Simulator yet? Uh, do you have the Steam copy so we can all play together? All of that. Um, setting expectations, just as important. Though those expectations should be lower, right? Everyone's dealing with a lot of crap right now. So maybe don't. It be you know hardcore right now you have to be there at nine and we're going to play at nine and we're going to play till 12 and you better be focused on the game the whole time you know what uh you're gonna kids are gonna come in you're you're playing on zoom you're gonna get distracted the phone's gonna ring there's gonna be a emergency whatever i think personally lower your expectations a bit at least for now until things return to normal now, though you are playing online in general, um, you could still get together before or after the game, right? So again, the instead of the hard and fast, maybe you, you get together before and you all grab your Keurig and you make a coffee and you talk about your different coffees and what you're doing, like we do on this show, on this podcast, for anyone who joins us live on Twitch has seen it. The first half hour of the show is me and Sean kind of chit-chatting and interacting with the chat before we get going right just something like hey what have you been up to i don't see sean every day we talk a lot online but i don't know what's been up with him and i tell i tell him how crappy my day's been he talks about how lousy his work week's been uh we hint at play testing we're doing for certain publishing companies and whatever right Put, put that in like make that part of your event right um do a Netflix Netflix watch party, right? Uh, this is something with the Misdirected Mark podcast been doing. They have their podcast and then they all go and they watch Deep Space Nine together, right? And now they're going to start playing Star Trek Adventures, the role-playing game. So their plan is to do that before doing the watch party, which I just think sounds awesome. I'm like, we're going to play some Star Trek and then we're going to sit and we're going to have a chat watch party and watch some Star Trek. I think that's awesome. The thing is, remember, there's a social thing, right? The game is important, but it's meant to be a hobby. You play with friends and you have fun with friends. Absolutely. Uh, you know, again, we, we jump, we get together, you know, if, if our game is going to go from eight till midnight, we start at seven and, and chat and, and, and gab and, and do whatever. And, uh, afterwards, you know, we do the stars and wishes and stuff yep. for, you know, another half an hour after, after the game to, to cool down afterwards. So one of the things you do have to watch for when playing online are these are things unique, stuff that doesn't come up during game night that can impact everyone's fun, right? So tech issues. Uh, you, Anyone who joined us again live during our pre-show got to see me playing with my dang camera yet again, um, trying to get it so that my camera looked good before we started going. Uh, just getting Zoom to boot. Uh, there was two Windows updates and an Adobe update and a Zoom update that I ran before going online tonight. Now, hadn't I done that, Adobe right now might have just interrupted our podcast because it decided now was a good time to update. I, uh, internet connectivity issues. 
um any any tech issues it could be any monitor goes out whatever mouse battery dies expect all this yep uh the other thing is logins uh if you are going to be playing at bga uh, make sure that you've got your bga login you know your login or you've already registered or if you're doing tabletopia that you've already you know the day before you go in and you make sure that your log you know your password and your your login mm -hmm. name and username so that you're not messing around with that before you know at at eight yeah. o'clock when the game is supposed to start uh you that tech issues like and logins and and digital stuff like that are your responsibility to handle in advance uh patches this is one um we I, not everyone knows this but um we actually try to play an MMO every Thursday night. We were streaming it, but no one watched, so we stopped. <laughs> but we play an MMO every Thursday night, and it's always lousy when you sit down at 9 a.m. Thursday when we're all about to get together and you open up the game and it's got a patch, right? That's something we should be doing a week ahead of time. And yes, I think all four of us have been guilty at least once of not doing it. Uh, the most egregious is Deanna's just because her laptop takes forever to patch. Well, at I least mean, the I rest think, of us, it's pretty quick. Well, I think the most egregious was when I tried well, to patch one night. Your whole thing. And yeah. And I had to completely uninstall and reinstall. I mean, I lost the yeah. night because it it stopped ever patching. <laughs> yeah, again. that was weird. Um, and so, but I mean, if I'd started that at noon, I would have known okay. before. <laughs> I would have yeah. at least known before nine o'clock when we were supposed to start that yeah. we were going to have a problem. Yeah, we we try to walk the walk, but sometimes <laughs> we sometimes forget. Uh, you're also going to have to deal with interruptions, right? Uh, most of us are home with our kids that we're not used to pets, uh, uh, whatever, family coming in, doorbells, Amazon packages being delivered. Expect interruptions. Uh, don't get upset if someone's got to go deal with something else, whatever that happens to be. Uh, lag can be a problem. Uh Everyone in our chat room is well aware of just how far behind the chat can be compared to where we're actually talking, which is why we've gotten way better at not just going, hey, chat, yeah, answer this question. And then Sean and I sit here for five minutes while we wait for the chat to catch up into what we're saying and then finally reply. And it ends up that we already read the reply. Uh, lag can be an issue. Um, a big one for people who aren't used to doing video chat, uh, which you can see a lot of is if you watch episode one to five of the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast on YouTube, is getting used to um, the lack of social cues and the lag when doing video chat, or even worse, text. And you end up talking on top of each other and you interrupt each other and someone doesn't get to talk at all because everyone else keeps talking. You can't tell they want to say something. All those visual and social cues that we deal with in real life pretty much subconsciously, for some reason, our brains don't tend to get it as well digitally, chat. especially if you got a big group. With two of us, it's not that bad, but you get four or five people in a Zoom chat room together and oh my God. I feel sorry for everyone, every teacher in Ontario right now. Uh, and, and text chat is actually almost worse um, because, well, if everyone's trying to talk at once on video, you can't understand anything. It's all garbage. But yeah. if everyone is trying to type at the same time, everything will come through, but the faster typers will come through first. And all of a sudden, the person who's been really excitedly working on a big post you know in, whether it's an rpg game or a, a big thing that they you know want to explain to somebody it gets not you know it's now no longer relevant because mm -hmm. everyone else has been chatting faster and moved on um and so you know discord and uh, messages and other other tools often have that i'm typing now warning mm -hmm. and that's a really important thing to pay attention to because maybe person x is is a slow typer uh don't just zoom ahead past them, wait for them to go. And, I, you know, as a DM, that's something I'm trying to be really uh, cognizant of. You know, I've got three or four players in front of me. After I make a post, if the first person responds and they've given me something I can play, bounce back with, I don't. I need to bite back, sit back, and wait mm -hmm. until everyone has had a chance to respond. And then maybe I'm still going to respond to that first person, but I've got better context because at the table, mm -hmm. everyone would have said, you know, in turn would have said, oh, this, this, this. Okay, great. Uh, whereas in text, maybe it's this, then this. Oh, okay, over there. Okay, great. Now we can go. Yeah, yeah I remember that. I tried running a Warhammer Fantasy roleplay game online many, many years ago on a BBS. <laughs> and that was the biggest problem 
is like I'd be like three steps into a combat and then someone would be responding to the first thing. And it just, they wrote a long descriptive post that showed up. But by then we've already like that beastman's dead. Like, <laughs> well, how do I don't even know how to react to this. Yeah, yeah, that is not easy. I think the main thing though, is just be aware that there are tech issues that playing online over Zoom, however you're doing it, Skype, voice chat, text is different than in person and be patient and forgiving of, of all people. Don't get impatient, don't get frustrated, realize that not everyone has the same level of technical expertise, not everyone has the same level of technology, not everyone has not everyone has a smartphone, not everyone is using the same tech. Maybe the per gamer you're playing with is at a library using like a super slow modem to play. Yeah. All right, let's wrap up with some ways to actually game online. So you've got people you got a game group you're ready you're gonna do it you found a time you're like all right we're playing nine till noon nine till noon wow that's <laughs> that's, that's oh, it's early morning or it's a really long game i'm not sure which <laughs> you're playing nine till midnight or whatever nine till midnight saturday nights where are you gonna do it right what 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 are, how are you gonna play these games so a lot of this is gonna be based on what do you want to play what are you playing, right? So depending on what type of game you want to play is going to send you to different places. So the most basic bare bones way to do it is using some type of video conferencing software, right? So using Zoom or Skype are probably the most popular right now. There's tons more out there. Is it a matter of you're just going to sit and chat? Are you going to play a card game where you have a single deck of cards and I'm going to hold up your card and you're going to hold up mine? You're going to play medium where I literally can't see your camera. I have my camera. We put the cards down. Are we going to have a Gloomhaven board set up with a webcam pointing at it with um, a letters a b c d and one two three on the hex grid so we can go i move from b6 to d12 what are you doing right you got to figure that out so you got zoom Skype, video chat uh bare bones right it'll work but doesn't really do anything to help you next you've got um what virtual conference rooms right or virtual chat rooms whatever you want to call them your discord your slack and again there's many more but those are the two most popular that i know of um, IRC was basically this back in the day. Um, I'm, I'm also reminded of the old AOL rooms. Any, any, any place you've got real time interactive chat, yeah. you know, enter post, not send, uh, you know, mm -hmm. sending messages on the email style, that, that real time interactive posting. So those are great for different style of games, right? Um, this one, I've seen people playing games like Gloomhaven where they take a picture of the board every round. Everyone writes in what they want to do. They, they, they send in pictures. Here's my hand. And they take a picture with their phone and they put it into their Slack channel showing here are my two cards. I move from this square to this square and you just take pictures every round. It's not optimum, but it works. Where those do shine is, as Sean's been talking about, he's been running a whole game of mass on Discord and it's worked great, yep. both for generating excitement and running the game. Then you have the next level, in my opinion. Actually, I think I'm going to jump down one. Uh, Roll20 and other RPG tools. So these are basically your Slack, your Discord with some type of board, some type of, of, of whiteboard that you can put on maps or dungeons or a grid or, and depending on the software, it's going to do way more for you. Like Roll20 can do stuff like Fog of War and calculate your arrows and check your ranges and all kinds of funky stuff. Or it can just be a whiteboard where you scribble on it like we did when we played um, Runaway Hirelings. But they, but the the key is it is tool it is a tool chest alongside uh, video the and chat. or text chest right so they it it is a a a, a kit prepared for you of, of tools often customizable uh, in order to enhance your gameplay whatever that gameplay may be yeah and then similarly you have the virtual tabletops for board games um which actually some people are using these for rpgs too usually miniature heavy rpgs but you've got again your big two are tabletop simulator and tabletopia right now um there are again others out there but those are the most well known uh tabletopia just runs in a web browser whereas tabletop simulator you have to download uh tabletopia is free sort of tabletop simulators you got to pay for and then maybe pay for games or maybe not um what these two do is in general provide you a virtual reality game room. You have your table, you have the game, you have the box, you have all the components and it's up to you to manipulate them. Now, some people have put additional work, especially on tabletop simulator to automate parts of it, 
all of them are designed for board games in general. So you have basic abilities like rolling dice and drawing cards and randomizing things. But basically, it's just a big virtuality. It is the same. There's setup time. You still have to unbox the game and open it and put the components out sometimes. And the, thankfully, there's no cleanup, but there might be setup and giving all the players pieces. Most of the good tabletop simulator mods at least do the first round, like your setup. But like you can put the cards wherever you want. You can flip the table. You can throw meeple at each other. You don't have to play the game. It requires a level of commitment by the people playing to actually play so that does require a, i guess a level of maturity when, when playing games there right next would be the next step which to me would be playing games digitally so these are fully they're video games they're video game versions of physical games uh, again you're going to have you, you have your role playing games so there are your neverwinter nights and there are various ways to play dungeons and dragons there's pathfinder online there is a pathfinder uh game that i don't know how i, I know there's a digital pathfinder but i know nothing about it um but i know it exists i know there are various world of darkness games i don't know how involved they are but then there's the simpler side of things with web-based gaming right like so board game arena yukata botaju uh we have again a whole podcast episode talking about those and comparing them what the difference is here is the game plays itself like like you you it it forces you to follow the rules of the game it's it does all the background work you can't cheat you can't throw meeple at each other you just have a digital version of your game and then the next version would be going to steam and buying the asmodee version yep. of terraforming mars or or whatever asmodee bundle is available at humble bundle this month <laughs> yes um and, and and connecting through the online asmodee system mm -hmm. in order to play that together and now what that will give you is often a more polished version yeah. of the game uh less bare bones um often better graphics sometimes better play sometimes not actually um yeah. it does depend from time to time yeah some games definitely uh the the some games i played i'll only play virtual now like a uh, digital other games i'll never play the virtual version again and it's interesting the average I might play virtual now and then. Like Terraforming Mars, I definitely prefer playing in person. But when I can't play in person, it's nice to have that option. Uh, and it's interesting because uh, I've I have played Roll for the Galaxy on uh, BGA a number of times. And it was really enjoyable once I figured out what the heck I was doing. <laughs> um, and then I got a chance to uh, beta test the Roll for the Galaxy app, the actual official Steam oh, app. Yeah. And, and I much prefer playing it on BGA. Um, oh, wow. I've un I uninstalled it. It's it's in my Steam library, and I've never installed it again. Because if I'm going to play, I'd rather play it on BGA. Yeah. No, there's definitely like BGA's really impresses me overall. We we've we've given them enough credit. I think uh, they really should be paying us something. They, or at least give us free a, yeah. lifetime subscriptions. They had an interesting uh, glitch this morning uh, that I mentioned to you on chat. Yeah. Uh, they have been so busy this year that they actually had a glitch caused by the fact that their number of actual game plays exceeded to to the 32 so they, they broke the integer bound the upper <laughs> upper bound on their counter for how many games they had played uh because they never expected to make it to 4.2 million games nope. played <laughs> that's a, that's a programming mistake yeah <laughs> Probably a pretty quick fix, but man, I bet you that was hard to figure out what happened. Well, yeah, I mean, it's an easy fix. It's a really easy fix, yeah. but uh, it's one of those things where you throw that in there. It's like, oh, no one's ever going to play 4.2 million games yeah. on our thing. And then you have a pandemic. <laughs> yes, yes. I, I need to change my variable from an integer to an array, but knowing that that was the problem, I, yeah. I can just imagine the people in the background trying <laughs> to figure out what went wrong. Uh, and then, so there's one final thing, and this is kind of an outstanding thing that I added in here. And this is the very specialty tools uh, where you get something like Vorpal Board, which was a Kickstarter uh, a couple of years ago that is a specific web-based interface and, and, and device to enable people to, uh, to help people play digital uh, video games. So if you have a board game and one person has the board game, uh, Vorpal Board was designed so that other people could play with that person uh, remotely. Oh, okay. Um, and so it's got, you know, a, a specific kind of webcam arm to help position your, your web, your phone over the board in the mm -hmm. best way possible. And, and, and it does a, a bunch of different little tricks and things. Um, 
Uh, and, and it's just sort of, uh, again, a specialty way to play physical board games remotely with people. Uh, and there's a couple of things like that out there other than that. But that's Yeah, I've seen, I've seen a few interesting ones people have been using. So one of the things uh, we did miss earlier that I think is a good one, this is mainly used for RPGs, but could be used for anything with a campaign game, is wikis. Uh, wikis for your campaign are a great way to keep players engaged between sessions. I have seen people set up wikis for board game groups as well to set up stuff like, what are we playing next week? And one of the things I've seen that used for that I thought was awesome is someone had set one up where they were able to import their board game geek collection so there was a way to see what games are in your local gaming community. So if you have a game group that, say, meets together at the CG Realm, one of our, our great local game stores here in Windsor, well, every member that shows up the CG Realm could log into this and then click in and connect their, 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 their board game geek list. So then you could go in it was searchable. So you're like, I want to play Through the Ages. And it's like, well, Sean has Through the Ages. So now I can reach out to Sean and say, hey, Sean, are you going next Saturday? Can you bring Through the Ages? I thought that was fantastic. I thought it was really well done, but mostly people use wikis for their campaigns, right? Because yeah. the whole thing with the wikis, you have multiple sections and multiple pages, and basically the way Sean's divided everything up on Discord, but then it goes up on the web for everyone to use. Uh, and actually, I I used a specialty wiki for RPG, uh, World Anvil, which yep. is for writers uh, or RPG groups. Uh, and so I've got different, you know, characters have their own pages there and locations, go. locations within the city have their own pages uh, on World Anvil, which I need to update, which reminds me. <laughs> <laughs> but that's another good way to keep people involved, especially if you can get players who are willing to do stuff like put in their own player notes or do things like journaling. Um, another way that you can keep players engaged is getting them to log their plays on. Um, I, I forget. I never did pay for that app that you use. And I can't oh, remember what it. Yeah. But, yeah, we haven't played BG it. stats. I haven't. Yeah, played. BG stats BG or stats. Uh, board board game or, or going on board game geek and logging your plays and interacting about them, right? Like so, tweeting them so that you can see. Oh, Sean played this on Wednesday, or I'm looking forward to play that. So that's just again a way to extend the game night past game night. Absolutely. Well, I think that's going to be it for our main thoughts on a, maintaining a game group. We're going to head over to the lobby and see if anyone in the chat room has anything to add. Oh. all right you fine folk in the chat room what do you got do you have additional tips and tricks what do you do to keep your game group going now in general what do you do on a normal you know saturday to monday sunday i guess also exists <laughs> um, and what have you done uh during covid have you have you were you able to maintain a game group as things have gone on i would say no for us like, like to, to make it personal our game groups have fallen apart we have none um, we've gotten together and played a couple games, um, me and Sean, and then we keep playing stuff on board game arena, but I don't really think of that as a game group. My Monday night group. I don't think I've talked to one of the players since the last time we got together. Like I, I assume Tom Barker's still alive and out there somewhere, <laughs> but I honestly haven't talked to him. He doesn't really play like go on Facebook or anything. Um, the rest of them, I keep in touch on Facebook. We have share memes now and then, um, Sean Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton, I still interact with regularly, and we do play Star Wars with, so I've kind of kept in touch with him, but like my Monday night group that I used to talk about back in 2019 and before, <laughs> gone, really, like they're still out there yep. somewhere doing things, but we're definitely not gaming together. Uh, Tech mentions uh, when he was in Ottawa, he went to a game night uh, with Ryan, and there must have been 50 people taking over a whole Boston pizza. Oh, that um, Ottawa game group, the, the group that organizes that posts on Board Game Geek, and I see it. It's always at Boston Pizza, and it looks awesome. I would have loved to have gotten Windsor to that point, but we never quite got big enough to, like, go to a restaurant. Right. And I'm sorry, I don't know who what it is about Windsor Gamers, but they refuse to buy food. Whenever we did have events at restaurants, it was really hard to get people to support the venue. So I, that would be my problem with going to Boston Pizza. Like, you need to have a big enough portion of those 50 people who will buy stuff to make it worthwhile for the restaurant. And right. when we did do a couple things at restaurants here in Windsor, it didn't go so great. At the, it depended though. Like there were other, like when we used to have events at the Kildare house upstairs, those went well, but that was a very different group of gamers than the people who show up at say the CG realm or even the people who showed up at the green Bean. But that, yeah. that is one of the problems with getting together at like, like at a restaurant or something like that. Uh, what else have we got here? Um, 
And she games is pointing out that she thinks it's even more important to figure out what you're playing ahead of time in the digital pandemic world because no one wants to play a rousing game of let's all download this or let's all go make an account of uh, at why, uh, you know, when you're sitting down to play. No, totally fair. Yeah, have being prepared, having have do the patching, do the download the game, make sure you have an account. Does everyone have a copy is definitely very important. Well, mm. I don't see a lot going on in the chat. Either we covered it really well, or <laughs> we put everyone to a sleep, or there's no one actually in there. No, I can tell there's people <laughs> in there. Um, or they're liking so bad they don't even realize we're asking. <laughs> could could be any or all. It could of be the any above. or the above. That's all good though. I, I'm gonna go with we 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 were very thorough this time, we and go. we covered all bases. I think I think we did a good job on this topic, and that's why the chat room has nothing. And none of them are gaming. They're they're all stuck in our same boat. I, I know that all tech does is win new games. He, exactly. He doesn't, he he's doesn't got a, actually play the a games huge we have. collection of games that have got uh, they're still in shrink because yeah, he's there's, got there's, no one to play with still in shrink even though i i know his daughter plays games with him but i i know jeff if he was in the chats had like now playing more than ever he has talked about that in our discord i was kind of hoping he'd be in there tonight and basically what happened with him is he made this switch to digital gaming for his role-playing groups and found out that that was actually freeing that like there was less prep work and he didn't have to worry about food and coffee and getting together and driving or going to someone's house or whose turn it was to do what you just all logged on at the right time and played and he's been doing all his stuff i think through discord uh with voice and chat so I, I, there are people in Windsor who are definitely still getting their game on. I, I We haven't been doing so great. But that's all right. All right. Remember, if you've got a game or game night question for us, all you got to do is head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop. And now we're going to take a look at the Creepy Cellar expansion for Ghost Fighting Treasure Hunters, one of our all-time favorites kids' games. Uh, the Creepy Cellar expansion for Ghost Fighting Treasure Hunters was designed by Brian Yu. Features artwork from Piero. This is the same pair that brought you the original game. Uh, interestingly, part of this expansion was released previously as the Ghost Fighting Treasure Hunters expansion pack. That was back in 2017. Now, this was only available at cons. Um, a couple online stores had it, like the Board Game Geek Store, but that's it. Uh, the Creepy Cellar includes everything you got in that expansion and some new material, actually quite a bit of new material, including a new board with more rooms on it. So what this means uh, that I think is important to note is that if you already have the expansion pack, there's a good chance you may still want to pick up Creepy Cellar, even though that would make some of that expansion, well, all of that expansion pack useless. You'd have duplicates for that. Though I'm guessing that the number of hardcore Ghost Fighting Treasure Hunter fans that picked up that expansion is generally small compared to the entire uh, range of, of yeah. owners. Yeah, this is, a, this is a Mattel mass market game that actually is, uh, has, I think, has a great appeal for, for gamers. So what this does, what this creepy seller expansion does is change up the gameplay of ghost fight and treasure hunters in a number of ways now this isn't like a modular expansion with some new stuff you can add but rather a totally new way to play the game due to this a lot of what you get in creepy seller actually replaces what you have in the base game where you don't need the stuff in the base game anymore while playing creepy seller now we don't have an unboxing of this one so you'll have to check out the pictures on uh that'll go on the youtube review or on the blog to see the components but what is in the box? All right. So what you get in Creepy Cellar is a totally new deck of ghost cards. This completely replaces the original. You also get 12 new treasure tokens, which replace the original eight from the base game. Along with that, you get some new stuff, like a whole new game board that attaches to the other game board. Well, that isn't physically attached, but you put it next to the other game board, which has two new rooms on it that fits at the side of the base game board. You also get two new decks of cards, one for the Ghost King and one deck of Cellar cards. You also get some new Secret Passage tiles, some new Jinxed item tokens, as well as two more haunts. I got to do math. Four more ghosts and the Ghost King miniature. I guess you call them miniature. I don't know, the piece, the playing piece. All right, so how do we use all this new and replacement material with our copy of Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters? All right, so the biggest change that happens with Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters Creepy Cellar is the goal of the game. In the original game, the goal was for the kids to sneak into this haunted mansion, 
grab a treasure, get out of the haunted mansion, drop it off outside and go back in and keep doing this to get all eight treasures. This changes in the expansion. Now, instead, the kids are locked in the house as soon as they enter, need to collect 12 treasures and bring them to these idols in the creepy cellar. Once they bring the 12 treasures to put them on the right idols, they're going to unlock the front door and then they all have to escape. Which much must really change the play experience just in that, because everything you've memorized about the doors and, and, and efficient pathways is going to be different now. Yeah, that's that's exactly what I expected when reading the rules for the first time. Like this almost feels like a new game, like a, a, a ghost fight and treasure hunters part two, more so than ghost fight and treasure hunters with an expansion. Now to play the new game, you start by placing the original board with the new cellar board in the center of the table. You're randomly gonna place one cursed treasure in every room on the original board. You're gonna shuffle the three decks and put them on a space indicated on the boards. The jinx tiles are put face down and mixed up, placed beside the board. The ghost king, which is a new cool looking blue king, blue ghost peach, goes in room L on one of the rooms on the board that used to hold the regular ghosts. And then four regular ghosts are placed out in four specific rooms that you don't care what letters they're in. Uh, so you end up with four ghosts and the ghost king on the board to start. Turns play out similar to the original game. Uh, you're going to roll the, the one, the movement die. Uh, you're going to draw a ghost card as long as there's a ghost shown on the die, which is on one of five sides. So one to five shows a ghost, uh, the, the six just has a six. You're going to draw that ghost card. You're going to do what the ghost card says. Then you're going to move your character a number of squares equal to the number on the die. Yes, this is a rolling move. If you land on a square, if you end your turn on a square with a, a room with a treasure, you can pick it up. And when you do that, the miniatures are actually designed so it fits in their backpack, which is pretty cool. Um, if there's that room has a ghost in it or what's called a haunt which is a, a bigger and nastier ghost you have to fight that ghost if able to well it seems quite similar in mechanics but it's the details of the, of the of each turn that really matter yeah the big thing here is what comes up in that ghost deck right you've got a completely new ghost deck it's got a purple deck back it's a lot thicker than the original one and there are some new things that can happen First off, there's the basic ghost, right? Just like the original game, there is a card for every room on the board. It's from A to N now. And if you draw that room number, you put a ghost in it. This is going to be familiar to people who play games like Pandemic as well. It's basically the same mechanic. You draw a room card, you put a ghost in it. Uh, so there are new cards in the deck for the new rooms in the cellar. Those work just like every other room. If you get two ghosts in the room, if you go to add a third ghost, it turns into a haunt, which can cause the game to end. If all the haunts are out, you lose. Then there's the green and blue locked cards, those locked doors in the map. These are from, same as in the basic, or sorry, same as the original game, but only in the advanced rules. Um, then there's the draw two and shuffle and the draw three and shuffle cards, as well as the just shuffle card. Those all do the same thing as the original game, but now you're going to shuffle both the ghost deck and the ghost king decks, but no other changes to that. Now the ghost king card, there's uh, multiples of these in the deck. So if you draw a ghost king, this is when something new happens. So what you're going to do is you're going to draw a ghost king card from a separate deck, the ghost king deck, and move the ghost king to that room. Now, if the ghost king is ever in a room with two other ghosts, it immediately turns those ghosts into a haunt and then goes to the next room and alphabetically which can just be nasty. This can lead to a cascading haunting effect as the ghost king just hammers through all the rooms, creating haunts. Now, if the rooms he moves into don't have any other ghosts or only have one, it doesn't do anything. Now, another rule with the ghost king is you can't fight the ghost king. You can't defeat the ghost king. The ghost king is permanent. Now, the final new card type in the ghost deck is the trap door card. Your character gets yanked through a trap door and comes out in another room. You draw a card from the Ghost King deck, move to that room, and then take the rest of your turn as normal. Wow, they've really taken action to minimize um, any chance of path memorization and optimization that, that could happen in that game. I mean, there was a whole lot of, okay, we're going to do this, and then on your turn, if you do this, and, and with all these changes, they're, they're, yeah. you don't have that anymore. Now, one of the things you do have that's exactly the same is fighting ghosts and hauntings. That's identical. You still use the black dice. Uh, with the additional rule, you can't ever defeat the ghost king. Now, a welcome new addition to this expansion that I really like are secret passage tiles. Uh, these are added to four of the rooms. They tend to be in the four corners. What these secret passages do is make a connection to the other rooms that have secret passages. For one movement point, you can move from any room with a secret passage to another. 
that's something that makes it way easier to get around the board compared to the original game. Now, the thing, though, with these tiles is they can only be used once. So if you go through a secret passage, it removes your origin tile. So like if you go from A to C, you remove the A. If you go from C to A, you'd remove the C. Now, there is a way to get those back by delivering jinxed items, but we'll get back to jinxed items in a little bit. And once again, uh, movement impact really seems to be a giant theme in this expansion. Yeah, yeah the, 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 the creepy seller and other ways to move around the room. <laughs> Creepy Cellar and Secret Passages actually wouldn't have been a bad term for this game. So next up, we have the new treasure tiles. I said, you're going to you're gonna get rid of the originals. The original game had eight tiles. They didn't really do anything. Like, they're numbered one to eight. And if you were playing on nightmare mode, you had to get them out of a house in order. But that's it, right? Like, there wasn't anything any special about them except for that. Well, now each of the treasure tiles, for one, there's 12 of them. So there's more to get. There's 12 instead of eight. And each of these are cursed treasures. And while carrying them, you have a penalty. So there's one that reduces your movement by one. There's one that makes you draw two ghost cards instead of one every turn. There's one that requires you to have an ally with you when fighting any type of ghost. There's one that stops you from using the secret passages that we just talked about. And one terrible one that adds a ghost to the room you're in before moving every turn. And then there's one that pins you if you're in a room with a ghost. So if any ghosts are in your room, you can't leave until you defeat them. And that really changes things up from, from the original game. I mean, mm -hmm. now all of a sudden, you know, they've changed up the movement drastically. And now they're really just turning the game upside down compared to the original. No, oh, I agree. Now, earlier I noted the goal of the game is to bring the treasures to the seller, right? You want to bring them to the idols. Well, the way you do that is that you have to travel to the appropriate room in the cellar while holding a treasure. Now, there's two different rooms added. Each room has six drop-off spots, with the right room having the odd-numbered spots and the left room having the even-numbered spots. And the treasures have to be dropped off in order. So you have to drop off the one spot in the right room, and then someone's going to have to drop off in the two spot in the left room, and then the three spot in the right room going back and forth. So similar to the advanced rules when it comes, except you're dropping off instead of getting out. Yeah, exactly. But it's, it's different because in the advanced rules, it's the treasure tiles that determine what order they have to go in. Whereas here, it doesn't matter what treasure you drop. It's what order you drop them off in. Right. So that is a big change. Where in the, the original advanced rules, you're going to run all the way to the D room to find out that that's the eight. You don't even need it until the end of the game. You don't get that feel at all. Right. This is more which direction am I going? And man, is there a lot of, are you going to get there before me? So you're trying to optimize your turn and not waste your time going to this one because someone's going to go drop that off and you're basically swapping between the two basement spots. Right. Now, I will note that with the difficulty variants, there is a way to play with the old tiles. And if you do that, you have to do both. You not only have to place the tiles one, two, three, four, five, the one has to go on the one, the two has to go on the two, the three has to go on the three. So that, that well, is, that, a, that that, is that's, that's a whole nightmare, nightmare level. <laughs> yes. So after you drop off a treasure, you do something new. You draw a seller card. Now, these are a mix of good and bad things. When I first started playing, I thought it was going to be like mostly good things. No, it's mostly bad. Uh, there are six good cards, 10 bad cards. Now, what you can do is you can find a set of keys that unlocks all the doors. Uh, for anyone who's played the game on Nightmare Mode, that's huge. Uh, you just get a free move. You roll the die, immediately move. A really nice one lets you remove one ghost from anywhere on the board. Not a haunt, but a ghost. And then the bad cards include adding a ghost to a random room. You're going to draw from the king deck. Or ending up with a jinxed item. Now, jinxed items are another new thing in this game. These are little square chits that, again, go in your backpack. And you can't help but hold on to this jinxed item because it's cursed, right? And it fills up your backpack. And you can't collect any treasure tiles while you have a jinxed item because your backpack's full. You also can't leave the house with a jinxed item. And remember, to win the game, you all have to leave the house. Now, what's nice is you do get a bonus for delivering a jinxed item. So every jinxed item has a letter on it for what room you can return it to. And if you're able to end your turn in that room, you can drop off your jinxed item. And when you do that, you can then take one of those secret rooms, secret passages you used, and put it back into play. So it's a way to get the secret passages back up. Once all treasure is safely placed in the cellar, 1 through 12, the players still have to escape the house. 
um weirdly it says escape the castle in the rules which i'm like wait castle and i even checked the original rule book it says house everywhere else in these rules so i don't know why it's this castle <laughs> if you can get all of the players out of the house again with no jinxed items you win if at any time all the hauntings are on the board the players lose that is the exact same lose condition from the original game though this expansion does add two new hauntings so it does give you a bit more breathing room from the original now is it everyone is out and, or no one wins or if one player gets out you can call them a winner is it or is it explicit it's it's all or none everyone gets out or you all lose you can't leave anyone behind leave no kids behind <laughs> so that's the basic rules the basic rules interestingly in this game start at the nightmare difficulty level considered to be the most difficult it's only in the back of the book does it give you ways to make the game easier which is a twist from the original. The original definitely stepped up the other way with here's the basic rules. And if you want to make it more interesting, do this. So the basic game is use the original eight treasures and remove the secret doors and remove the draw and shuffle cards, which is very similar to the basic rules of the original game with the new goal, right? Where you're still, you're still moving the treasures to the basement to unlock the front door to get out. Then there's the advanced setting, which has you use those original tokens. And this is one I mentioned earlier, where they have to be placed in order. So the one on the one, the two on the two. Interestingly, that is considered easier than the nightmare setting because you only have eight to place instead of 12. Um, and you do all put all the nasty cards back in, the locked door cards and the shuffle cards are back in. Well, it's good to know that the players who prefer the lighter play still have an option with the expansion uh but is it as easy as the original when when you go to that easier mode or is it still a harder game well i think that's jumping ahead a bit uh but it's actually kind of a mix of both and i'll get into that in a little bit after i go over some of the other stuff my other thoughts on it so before getting into the gameplay um right away i say components are awesome like they are great um this it's the same as ghost fight and treasure hunter so if you've seen that you know um so it's to be expected but i was just impressed by the quality like nice mounted board great i, I love the minis in this game the, the rubbery plastic they're made of like you're, you can't you could run these over they can be squished like you're not going to damage these they look awesome they're cute they're not spooky creepy they're cute ghosts uh the tokens came pre-punched like they're a nice thing the card quality is good um i've proven that these cards can stand up to many plays with my original copy these are the same um the kids especially my youngest love the new card art so the new deck has new card art whereas i guess the king deck has the old card art from the old rooms and they like seeing the new things the ghosts are doing in each room um the other thing i like too that i didn't catch on until like third or fourth play is there are no words anywhere to be seen except for the fact that it uses the letters a through n this is 100 percent language independent everything is artwork and iconography to, to get your point across and there's a lot more iconography in this game because all the tokens right you got the jinx tokens you have the the treasure tokens each have a symbol on the back of them you got new cards with new things going on and all of them just made sense like it literally took one reference of the book once each, right? What's that mean? Okay, I, I'll never have to look that up again. Like when you look at the draw two ghost cards, well, the picture of the token shows two ghost cards. And the room, the one that says you can't use the, the secret passage, well, shows you the symbol for the secret package with the traditional red knot, you know, circle with a line through it. Like it all just made sense. So none of the quality problems we saw in some of the alternate versions of uh, the game. Yeah, this does not have the Ghostbuster problem. We will just call it. There, There is a different printing. Uh, it is worth pointing out this is not compatible with Ghostbusters Protected Barrier. This is only works with Ghost Fighting Treasure Hunters because of the boards being completely different sides and the card quality being different. The boards won't even line up because uh, there were definitely quality issues right. with the original Ghostbusters Protect the Barrier version of Ghost Fighting Treasure Hunters. All right. Before getting into details about Creepy Seller and my final thoughts on it, what I think about it, if you haven't gotten an idea from what I've already said, I do want to point out that I love Ghost Fighting Treasure Hunters. Like, I adore it. Like, it is just such a good game. I've said it many times in this podcast. I've said it on social media. Every time someone puts a Facebook question about kids games, I'm jumping in there recommending this game. Like, the, the, I am an ambassador for, for Ghost Fighting Treasure. And Mattel should be paying me for this. Uh, this is just as much fun. That, like, it's the only kids game I played that is just as much fun for kids as is for adults. Like, it, it's not only a game my kids will take down off the shelf, play on their own. I hear them laughing. I hear them having a great time. But it's a game, and they'll have fun playing with us. 
but it's a game I'll break out without the kids around. Like I have brought this out to public play game nights, like, like heavy gamers out to play at a, at the game store, ready to play some games. And we're playing ghost white and treasure hunters. It's that good. I, I, this is a game I'll break out with my regular game group. I, I am a fanboy of this game and I don't expect it to change. Now I, I know I've played it with your kids and with adults uh, at parties uh, and with adults and kids at parties mm -hmm. uh, and, and just really gotten into it. You just, yeah. you get into the game because there's a lot of thought involved. Yeah. I, I it's, it's got a kid's theme, but it's not a kid's game. Kids can play it. Yeah. Now moving into creepy sellers. As for this expansion, I was a bit surprised by what you got with this. Like, I, I thought you were going to get modules. Like I really did. The, the fact that you could buy that old expansion and like board game geek for a while had a geek up version where you could just get the King. Like I just expected it to be all these little modules that I could add to it. Like, like you could just, I, I'm going to have the King in my game and make it a little bit more difficult. Or you know what? We're going to use the secret passages just to make the game a bit easier. Or I'm going to use both. We're going to have the King and the secret passages, but ignore the seller. We don't need that. And, and I guess you could do that, but that's not how it's designed. Like, that's not how the rule book's written. Instead of a bunch of modules, you get a totally new mode of play. Something that, as I mentioned earlier, kind of feels like a new game. Like, it feels like I'm playing Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters 2.0 rather than Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters with an expansion. So I, I wouldn't have expected the modular format myself, uh, as this just doesn't feel like a hobby game. Uh, and, and really that's a hobby game sort of thing as opposed to something you'd expect from Hasbro. Uh, it's true, but it was a German Euro game before it was brought over by Hasbro. So to me, it is still a hobby game. It just happened to get marketed as a kid's game, which in a way I think, well, for one, it did good for them because it's available in target, but it's, I, I think a lot of hobby gamers are going to overlook it because of that. Right. Now I do have to say while reading the rules, I expected uh, creepy seller to make it feel like a different game like i thought it wasn't going to feel like ghost fighting treasure hunters anymore it's going to feel like a new game but somehow it doesn't like it just everything that was added fits in so well with the theme and the general flow of roll the die flip the card to see what happens then move at the end of your turn pick up stuff or fight like that's all still there and it still very much feels like you're playing ghost fighting treasure hunters but ghost fighting treasure hunters with a bit more going on like there's just more options each turn. Um, one of the things that I like is the fact that, that it's not obvious that I this is what I need to do every turn. I have variety. And as Sean's noted a couple times, there are definitely more potential paths to take, more pathways, more routes to get everywhere on the board. There's more to worry about, right? Like you have curses now, you have jinxed items, and well, the ghost king to worry about on the board. Nothing wrong with more of a game we already love, so long as it doesn't tamp down the fun. Yeah. Now, one aspect that I like about this is just in general, your turn's more interesting, right? In the base game, most turns are uh, draw a card, put a ghost on the board, and move. And that's it. Now and then, if you're using the advanced rules, you might have draw extra cards, the door's locked, so you post, put, put extra ghosts out. But that's kind of it. Now, on your turn you're going to roll the dice and maybe you're going to place a ghost or maybe you get yanked through a trap door or maybe the ghost king moves or maybe the doors become locked or maybe you're going to do something else. You, you, the new ghost will just get placed out like normal. Along with this, the draw two and draw three then shuffle cards are less punishing. They were what made nightmare mode in the original game a nightmare. This happened because the deck is diluted in a way. The, the game has more special cards, right? There's more chances of drawing the trap door or drawing the, the, the king, right? There's more little different things in the thing that aren't just place a ghost. So we found that the drawing two or three didn't tend to have you place two or three ghosts. I, I think this is a good thing because, man, they were rough in the advanced version of the game. Yeah, which it's a nice uh, game balance issue, but depending on the setting more interesting turn could be seen as a negative, especially in those party situations where the game is fun, but as something alongside of a good chat, which happened a lot of times, especially on yeah. like our new year's Eve nights where it wasn't as intense a game to completely distract you from True. having a good party. 
yeah, it's definitely there's more thought required. It, it is a more complicated game. Uh, it's probably worth looking on board game to see what people have rated the weight, but I have to assume the weight's higher. I did note the expansion rated better than the base game. So I, in general, gamers do seem to like it more. So yeah, it, it, it stepped it up from that kid's light party game in a way into something a little heavier, which in, personally I think is a good thing, but it does depend on what you're looking for out of your game night. And then we get to the difficulty, right? Uh, so Sean asked about this, and I kind of saved this for later because I have quite a bit to say on this. So this is weird. Like, I, I have a hard time talking about the difficulty of this game because it's so strange what they've done here. So part of that is that deck distribution I just talked about, right? Because the, the, the plus two and the plus three cards aren't as bad because the deck distribution is different. And there's way more turns where, yeah, just the Ghost King moves, which really isn't a bad thing at the beginning of the game. But then if there's lots of ghosts on the board, that could be horrible. So deck distribution definitely made it a little easier but then there's the cursed treasures those are punishing like like every treasure you pick up does something terrible to your character in a fun way like it's a good thing but man that ups the difficulty right you're either moving less or you're summoning more ghosts or you can't use the secret passages right so you're like oh man the difficulty's gotten way harder but now they have secret passages so these gems are easier to deliver than ever so you're like, oh, well, yeah, I'm punished. But you know what? It's only going to take me two turns to get there because I can take the shortcut. So that kind of reduces it. But then you deliver it and you flip over a card and it ends up and puts extra ghosts out. Or you get a jinx tile. Well, now you got a jinx tile. You can't collect treasure. Well, if you can't collect treasure, you can't win. So now you got to waste turns going to deliver it. But then if you do deliver it, you get one of those secret passage like it's it's just kind of up and down right and then there's the ghost king right like the ghost king you got to watch out for because it you definitely got to watch for the chain of haunts you don't want to have a bunch of twos in a row where it's like ghost king moves here and makes a haunt and then moves here and makes a haunt moves here and makes a haunt so you got to really watch for that but then again it doesn't kill you because well they gave you two more haunts so if it does happen it's not like you're just going to lose instantly so it, it's just weird right so the end result we found is that using the full expansion rules, like the, the default nightmare mode is a much harder game than the base game of Ghost Fighting Treasure Hunters. Like it, it's definitely a step up there. Uh, you're not going to be able to play with little kids who, and without coaching, right? Like you, you got to work together. You got to, you need more teamwork. You're going to have to, to work as a team and really strategize, not just run around and roll some dice. But on the other hand, we found the full nightmare version to be way easier than the nightmare mode in the base game. And in all the times I have played the original ghost fighting treasure hunters with numerous different groups, with kids, with adults, with hardcore gamers, with Euro gamers, with hardcore. I've never beat it on nightmare. It's never happened. I've never gotten all eight out on or in order with the rooms locking and the plus two draws and the plus three draws. Meanwhile, Grace and I were able to beat Creepy Seller on Nightmare Mode with just two players. Now, I will note, two players is the same as playing four players. You play four characters if you play two players. But we beat this. I've never beat Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters on Nightmare. Now, maybe we just got lucky. Maybe it was a fluke. But to me, it seems like the base game Nightmare Mode, way above Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters Basic, but still under Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters Nightmare. Well, it's interesting about the teamwork um, because I felt like that I was there already. Uh, you know, I remember sitting there and, and talking with uh, Tom, actually, as you mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, uh, and discussing, okay, well, uh, we got to worry about, you know, right now blue's locked, so we got to expect green to lock. So we're I'm going to make a run down this side of the board if you head up this way and that way we can do. You know, I remember going through those discussions about yeah. plans and, and who's going to go where. Um I, I would say it's even higher here, especially, like I said, one of the curses is you can't fight ghosts without having someone with you. So that forces you into that teamwork role. And then there's the other one that won't let you leave a room if there's a ghost there, any type of ghost, right? Like not even a haunt. So again, that requires that whole, hey, I can't get out of here. I need some backup. And that's mainly where I saw the more interaction of it. Right. Plus, again, watching for those cascading haunts seemed to be a little more important. They, that Once you had two ghosts in a room, it was scary. But if you had two ghosts in that room and the next room in the next room, it was even scarier. Right. So overall, I was very impressed by Creepy Cellar. Uh, it makes ghost fight and treasure hunters just feel more balanced 
more polished and definitely more of a gamer's game and less of a mass market kids game. Like I actually have a strong feeling, and I don't know if this is true, that the com- this was the complete game. This this is the game the designer designed, and then Mattel went in and cut chunks off it to simplify it for the mass market. Now I don't know if this is true. I I actually don't know, but I have to say that it feels more complete together with Creepy Seller with Ghost Fighting Treasure Hunt. I feel like I have more of a game, a more complete finished polished game it's more interesting the difficulty seems to be better balanced um now that i finally own it i can't see playing just ghost fighting treasure hunters ever i'm always going to have the seller road i'm always going to have the king we're going to be dealing with jinxed items yeah no it's really good to hear and i think it really does sound like this is the difference between a hobby game and a mass market game now, always want to play with the base game and expansion does lead me to one rather annoying problem. And yes, this is a first world problem. This is a this is a gamer problem. This is the same reason I don't like games in tins. Um, with the included plastic box inserts that come with both expand well, the base game and the expansion, there is no way to fit the contents of the expansion in the base game box, which is a total shame. Now I hate bringing two game boxes for one game out to game night if I can help it. Um, So I did try to stack the inserts to see if it worked and it kind of works. I've got a picture of it. I haven't shared it yet. You get the whole lids off by, you know, an inch or so, but it's probably a bit much. Um, What I probably I'm going to end up doing is taking the insert out of the base game and swatch swapping over to baggies for everything and everything will be loose in the box, even though they had really nice inserts. Well, there are solutions available, custom oh, inserts course. for the game that will handle the expansion and premium sleeved cards already on the market. Yeah, that does not surprise me at all. But then you'll never play it again if you get that. That's true. <laughs> if I get a box insert, we'll never play it. See, technically, this is my kid's game. It goes on their shelf. So maybe I should let them decide what to do. But I just worry things are going to get mixed. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I It's frustrating, but I get it. People do that. So as for final spots, um, to start off, if you have kids and don't have Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters, fix that. Like, like, just go get it. Find it somewhere. I don't I don't know where the best price is right now. If you want, I'll look it up at some point. Just hit me up online and I'll find you a good price. Just get Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters. If you don't have kids and you like cooperative board games at all, get it. Like, this is a great example of a thematic cooperative game that isn't just about placing and removing cubes on a map. While it might be marketed to kids, this game has way more than enough meat on it for hobby board gamers to enjoy, especially when you throw in the higher difficulty levels. You throw that up to that nightmare difficulty level, and it can be a brain burner. Now, as for Creepy Seller, if you own Ghost Fighting Treasure Hunters and like it, just just even a little bit. If you're like, eh, kind of like Ghost, just buy it. Uh, This is a must-have. I will say, assuming you can find it, this is not an easy-to-find expansion. This is a great expansion for a great game that just adds more to love. I would go so far as to say that this completes Ghost Fighting Treasure Hunter, making it a deeper game, more player options, more replayability. I'd also say that if you played Ghost Fighting Treasure Hunters and thought it was okay, something you'll play but probably wouldn't suggest, this may be the thing to turn that play experience from meh to good, if not great. Well, be sure to check out our written review of the Creepy Cellar Expansion for Ghost Fighting Treasure Hunters over at TabletopBellhop.com. And now, for something completely different, we're going to take a look at a digital game with some definite board game roots, Rogue Book, a roguelike deck builder. Before we get into the nitty-gritty, I want to thank NACOM for providing us with an early access code for the demo version of Rogue Book. Right, Rogue Book was developed by Ab- Abracam Entertainment. I'm not even sure if I'm pronouncing that right. Shows how much I know about video games. Uh, this is the team behind Feria, whatever that is, who partnered up with Richard Garfield to create this game. Now, that's a name I know. That's a name all hobby gamers should know and recognize as the man behind Robo Rally and the great Dal Moody. Okay, well, maybe that's just me. Those are the games I love. Most people are going to know that name from Magic the Gathering, uh, the most popular card game uh, i'd say in the world but you could probably still beats it out somehow but as far as hobby games go you can't beat magic the gathering for its renown as soon as i read the first press release stating that richard garfield was working on a digital deck building game i jumped at a chance to check this game out 
Now, Rogue Book is currently up for pre-order at Humble Bundle. It's expected to enter full release in April. Now, if you pre-order now, you get access to the demo version of the game, which is what I've been playing. Now, this demo version does limit you to one specific hero, hero pair. It doesn't allow for persistent progression through skill trees and limits everything to the first six levels. So, I think it should be obvious, but we don't have an unboxing for this one. It's a digital world we live in. Yeah, I could show you it installing maybe on my computer. That's about it, or my Steam update key. Um, so, Roguebook builds itself as a deck-building roguelike, and, well, that's what it is. Uh, you start off each game at level one with your hero. You then go recruit a companion to journey with. Uh, in this demo, you're limited to one specific character, so one pair, but there will be more in the full game unlock. Uh, you then walk across the hex grid to the main gates and start exploring. Now, the world you're exploring in Rogue Book is made up of a hex map, only part of which you can see. You get the little starting area where you choose your companions and the gate, and then once you open the gate, it draws a path to the end, to the tower where the first boss monster is. Now, I say draws. This is where the whole book part of Rogue Book comes in. Uh, the whole theme here is that, like if you're exploring a book, it's opened up like a book and you're walking around like a little miniature on this book that's getting drawn into the book as you're exploring. And a big part of this exploration is using a resource specifically called ink to reveal more of the map or to draw more of the map. You start the game with five pots of ink. Actually, you start each level with five pots of ink, which is worth noting, which can be used to draw in the, the ink you start with, the hexes surrounding your character. As only a path of the boss is revealed at the start, you're going to want to do this, right? You're, you could rush right to the boss, but you're going to want to reveal more parts of the map by using your ink. When you do this, you're going to find all kinds of stuff shows up on the map, right? You got gold sitting there to pick up. You got Vault of Wisdoms, which lets you go spend 40 gold to get a new card. Uh, you're going to get three to pick from. You pick one of the three cards. There's Wandering Merchants that let you spend your gold to buy cards, uh, artifacts, and gems. More about those in a bit. There's these uh, towers where if you go to a tower, they reveal the map around them. So they're a really good way to show off big sections of the map. Uh, there's runes of sight where if you do one of those, they're going to pick something cool on the map that you can't see and reveal the area around it. So it might be like a, a gem over in the corner or a pile of gold over here, and it'll show you that. Um, there's an alchemist lab that lets you transform your cards. So you take your basic cards and replace them with better cards. So you transform your, you know, a typical deck building thing where you're getting rid of your basic starter hand for better cards. Uh, there's hearts where you heal your characters 10 each. And one of the big things is monsters to fight at various difficulty levels. And it kind of warns you, this is an elite fight. This is an easy fight. Now, when you do defeat a monster, you'll get gold and other rewards. Uh, usually, uh, just gold for the weak ones and then better rewards for the elites. And you'll get things like new car cards, items, gems, and artifacts. But more importantly at this point is you will get a pot of special ink. Now these special inks work like your regular ink, but will reveal parts of the map different ways. So I don't remember the names of them and I'll probably never remember the names of them, but one does like a straight line of five hexes. Another one does three hexes in opposite directions and you pick which direction that is. Uh, there's another one that actually uses up your main ink, but it does like a big blotch of five range around you or three range around you. And there's all kinds of different inks. So aside from the, the ink uh, and the way it's sort of unveiling the fog of war, uh, nothing especially all that unfamiliar to most card battlers and roguelike lovers. Yeah, as far as I know, I, I will admit I am not greatly experienced in I played a few different ones, mostly on mobile, um, not a lot of Steam games, but this does seem pretty straightforward with, with this interesting theme and look to it. So what, uh, what some of this stuff does, right? So stuff you can pick up. So like ink reveals more on the map. Gold is used at the merchants and vaults to get new cards and improve your deck. Uh, the card improvements are done with gems. So I mentioned getting gems. So this is something that from what I understand is new in this game is every card has a number of sockets on it. So your basic cards have one socket. The ones you get when you first start playing will have two sockets. And I guess you can have that more later in the game. Each socket can hold a gem. And what gems do is make a permanent improvement to the card. Now, these are not minor. This isn't like a little do plus one damage. It's more like do plus 14 damage to the closest enemy. And what's interesting is you could socket that on a card. 
So you could have it on a card that's like draw two new cards and do 14 damage. It doesn't have to go like on a damage card or it could be on one of your defensive cards. So your defensive card also does damage or it could be on like your buff that buffs the guy behind you or whatever, right? Um, another example is just draw more cards, right? Which if anyone's played any deck builder, the best cards in your deck are the ones that let you draw more cards because they don't really take room in your deck, right? Well, you throw a draw an additional card on your standard defense card. And now it's a way better card. There's tons. Items are equipped on your characters. Now, remember, you have your main character and your companion. They're both your heroes. You put an item on your character to give them some kind of bonus. Uh, again, additional damage, starting with certain cards in your hand, starting with an ally in play, healing, all kinds of stuff, right? Roguelite. Think, think Diablo and the number of different items it can drop. Artifacts are the biggest, most powerful items. Those are global effects that are always in play. And they're going to affect both your characters and give some kind of benefit. Now, at the start of every floor in the game, there are four artifacts in the four far corners of the map, though there's no way you're going to get all of them, which we'll get to in a minute. So if you do want one, you're probably going to have to be pretty strategic with using your ink to make sure you get it. So it's interesting that it's a flexible card upgrade system yeah. when most of the roguelike deck builders tend to be... Um, a straight upgrade. So the, the the card is this and it upgrades to this and that's it. Yeah, no, this is completely customizable. This is you decide what gem to go onto what card in each of your character's decks, right? So your deck's actually made up of cards for both your characters. So you actually get to decide which hero is going to even get that bonus. Now, as for battling, um, again, this is deck builder, right? Um, the big difference here from other physical and digital deck builders I played is that you are playing two characters and your deck is mixed with cards from both of those characters and they're very well easily co color coded. You have the white and the orange character to start. Now when battling, every battle starts with one of your two characters in the front, you can change the default and this position matters whether they're in the front or the back during the fight. Now for one, you're gonna get a bonus for who's in front at either the start or end of each round. So your default characters, I don't remember their names, sorry. Your default characters are, one of them gets plus two defense if they're in the front at the end of the round, and the other gets plus two to all their attacks if they're in the front. So depending on if you're going for attack and you're defending that round, you may want to swap them up. You get a hand of five cards and you get three mana to use them. Now this is a big difference from every physical deck builder I played, but I know it's common in digital deck builders where you're not playing your whole hand every turn. Anyone who's playing Ascension Star Realms is used to playing everything. These digital deck builders seem to have moved away from that for some reason. It's all about only playing certain cards from your hand. All the starting cans, cards only cost one mana, and you have three mana to use. So at the start of the game, before you've improved everything, you're only going to play three of your five cards every turn. Now, the most expensive card I've seen so far playing cost five, but it was one that went down every time you used a different card from the same character at the same time. So it's a five, but then if I used an attack and a basic defense, it's down to a three. Note there are cards that increase that mana level as well as artifacts and items that can increase the mana level. So you can get up to playing more cards. Now, when battling, you're gonna face one or more enemies. I've seen up to six. Again, the order matters. So the a monster in the front is different than the monster in the back. Most cards in your deck are split between attack and defense cards. Attacks do damage to a specific target. So when you play the card, you pick which of the enemies to attack. Defense moves the defending character to the front if they're not, and then gives you a number of shields. Each point in shields you have blocks one point of attack when the opponent's attack. With this, uh, it's a deck builder. It's a card game. It's designed by Richard Garfield. There's way more. Uh, I, there's no way I can get into it here. I'm not going to mention every card. There's keywords. There's lots of keywords. Uh, one example is charge. It does extra damage, but moves the character to the front. Uh, missile cards are cheaper, which I thought was great if they're used in the back, as well as getting as cheap as zero, which could get you to that being able to play all five of your cards. Uh, there are allies, all kinds of types of cards. Now, allies are, I thought, are unique to this. I'd never seen this in any deck builders I played. Um, these stay in play. So it's kind of like a summon in magic, I guess, in a way, but different. So it's it's a card that you pay. They're always expensive. They usually cost two or three. So they cost a lot of your mana to put up, but then they stay in play each round. They have a power level that goes down every round. So a countdown. So if you play an ally with a five, he's going to be in play for five rounds. Uh, then they're going to do something. Like there's allies that defend for you. There's allies that attack for you. They're usually tied to the character that played them. So for example, the one that attacks every round has the same attack power that that character had that round. So it only actually like works if you pair them up. Um, 
many of them actually have abilities you can use too by clicking on the card that gives you a new thing you can do every round. Uh, interestingly, one of the better items I found in play actually had you start with allies in play. At the beginning of every round, your character started with allies. Um, then there's a bunch of stuff based on the fact you have two characters, like cards that buff the other character, cards that put another character in front, uh, let you swap positions, and so on. Yeah, the the multi character aspect is interesting, but what I'm I'm really noticing, um, and again, I'm, I'm much more of a computer game player of this mm-hmm. type, especially than you, is that they've really taken a lot of aspects from various different games and mashed mm-hmm. them all together into one meta game. It's, I mean, this is this is really sort of the 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 meta deck uh, deck builder roguelike of all deck builder roguelikes, <laughs> right? Um, the one. The one unique aspect that that just I haven't come across and I can't find I can't think of in any games I've played that is unique is this ink concept. Right. Yeah, that was definitely different to get used to. Um, and then that I guess it makes sense, right? If you're going to put out a new roguelike deck builder, you base it on all the successful ones that are already out there. So jumping back to combat, so everything has hit points. Once you get rid of those, that creature or character dies. Um, which I want to bring up because death, I think, is pretty unique. When one of your characters dies, you're going to put two wound cards in your deck. These are the garbage cards. You'll recognize these from a bunch of physical deck builders. These are the cards that do literally nothing. They just take up room in your deck. When you draw them, you're just like, oh, I have wound cards. Um, And then the other thing it does is it takes all of that character. So remember, you have two heroes. So one hero is unconscious. Their entire set of cards flips. So like, I don't know if it was physical, I'd flip the cards over, but like they switch to a new type of card, which are called revive cards. What they do is they say specifically on them is play three of these and the character revives. Now this doesn't have to be done in one round. Like you don't have to get lucky and draw three of the same character. You can build it up. Like I play one this round and then two the next round. If you manage to get these in play, you will then the character will stand up. They'll get back up and they come back with a handful of health. Uh, It's not a lot, like it's like 15 to 12, and they probably won't last long. But then you can also use their cards, including the round they came back up. Now, if at any point both your characters are knocked out, game's over. Game's done. Now, while playing, your characters will level up in an interesting way. This progression is based on how many cards are in your deck. Soon as you get your deck to 14 cards, you get your unlock. Then another at 18 cards, 22 cards, and finally 26 cards in your deck. Now, at each unlock point, you're going to pick an ability. And what it is, is each character has abilities, and then there's a team ability. So at the first unlock, it's do you want to unlock the ability for Hero 1, the ability for Hero 2, or a team ability? Well, the Hero 1 abilities affect Hero 1, the Hero 2 abilities affect Hero 2, and the team abilities affect both. Yeah, it's interesting because in a lot of games, you know, in a deck builder, so often deck size is a negative. Mm-hmm. But here, they're actually encouraging you to build up the size of yeah. your deck. Uh, is there even a way to thin your deck at all? You did mention you could transform yeah. your, your basic cards to better ones. So the only way to get rid of a card in your deck is to go to the Alchemist and transform it into a new card. Right. So now, you're, when you, you never lose cards, you just change what they are. Yes. You replace a, a lousy starter card that gives you plus five defense and you transmute it into this like great card and when you transmute you like not only get a card you get some gems like it, it right it's very expensive um i've done it very seldom but it's very powerful because for one it gets rid of a lousy card and gives you a good card so that's that's kind of it right you you go around exploring the map using the ink uh you're trying to improve your deck you kill the monsters get more ink to explore new areas and eventually you're going to run out of ink and when you do that you got to go take on the boss monster if you're able to beat them, and I got to say, if they are not easy, you'll move to the next floor. Once you inevitably end up dying, remember, this is a roguelike, you're going to start over at the beginning of the game, back on floor one again, and you're going to pick a companion. And in the demo, you're going to pick the same companion every time because they only unlock the one. While playing, hopefully you found, I don't know what they're called. They, they, they look like slips of paper with runes on them, scrolls. I don't know. They're, they're loose. I, whatever they are uh they don't show up very often like like every now and then they'll show up on the map and when they do like you're like yes thank you for showing up you do get them for some battles um elite bosses and you will definitely get one if you beat a boss if not two these you use for permanent progression on a skill tree 
and it's a typical branching skill tree with all kinds of stuff on it. Um, your basic unlock lets you unlock a new team power, and then there's a different basic unlock, and you need lots of these. Like to, to unlock the first one takes one, but then the next one takes five, which means you're going to probably have to play through three or four times to get to that next one. And like to fill this whole tree, you're looking at hundreds possibly thousands of plays like like i i can't i didn't get very far in the in the skill trees so there's that there is also another form of progression every time you play the character you play gets experience points what i haven't figured out is how that's determined i have no idea i just i play it and the bar goes up so far i don't know i don't know where that's coming from it's done in the background if you get it to the level end you then get to add better cards to their decks and again, this is permanent, which the next game you start, you're going to start with these better decks. So yeah, this the, the leveling is is yet another feature from yet another game that I hadn't actually added to the list yet of games <laughs> this game is made up of. Yeah, <laughs> so so yeah, this is pieces parts, right? Um, so what all this leads to is, like I said, what, what, what is known as the grind, right? Uh, the entire game is about grinding and very gradual progression. You play it over and over and over again, making small incremental improvements to your heroes and decks, hoping each time you get a little further into the game and you find more of those skill sheets of paper and you get further into the rogue book. And well, that's what a roguelike is, right? And this is a roguelike. Yeah, they've certainly nailed the concept down with the name. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there's no question of what you're getting out of this. You're getting a roguelike in a book. <laughs> yep. Road card or yeah. road deck builder is about the only thing they could have done to get it better. So uh, thoughts on it overall. Uh, I had fun. It, it's well-designed. Uh, it looks great. I didn't see a single glitch or technical flaw or anything. Um, I was invited to a discord channel where I did see people who found small little, like this card didn't quite work right, but it's, it didn't feel like a beta or anything like that. This feels polished. Uh, the music's good. The art's good. Uh, one complaint is when you do start the game, you have to watch the animation and you have to watch that every time. Oh. So that was that, that can be a little annoying. Um, I will admit I was disappointed when I found out my review copy was only the pre-order demo. Uh, but there was, you know what, there's plenty of content there. Like it kept me busy. It let me experience pretty much all the game. I would have loved to have tried different heroes, but like I didn't get far enough in that I hit the level six cap. No way. Like I, like I play these games, but I, it, it, this is a, this is a fun game. I, it's a good time killer. Now, what I didn't do with this, and I don't know if this is a knock against or what, how most people play these games, but I never like spent an evening playing Rogue Book and playing through level one over and over and over and over again. What I would do is I would spend a day blogging or writing a review or sharing deals on tabletop deals. And then I'd sit there and before going downstairs to watch Netflix, I play one round. I, I would start fresh. I'd grab my companion. I'd go out. I'd get, get past level one, maybe, or whatever. And that's it. And then I'd go watch Netflix or whatever. And then go do something else. Maybe that same day I do another run. Like maybe I'm taking a break in the middle of the day. I'm like, I'm going to go grab lunch. And it's a good lunch game, right? Like I have a sandwich in one hand and kind of click around. I'm not having to type, you know, it's type all you're playing. So I'd have a sandwich while playing. I do one run. And then again, before going to bed, I play one more run, right? Like it was it, play it once, get through it. And maybe later play again. I don't know about you, how you play. Yeah, no, like I, I have to say when it, when I'm, if I'm pulling up Slay or, uh, or one of the, one of the various ones it's generally i might at most i do i would i would do three if i had okay. you know a, a chunk of time but that's about the most number of runs I, do. So I i wasn't sure i wasn't sure if i was consuming this how people would normally consume this or well not. i think you know again a lot of these it's it's like animal crossing right you yeah. people will play it the way they play it i'm sure there are people out there oh who yeah grind away and and more power to them that's awesome yeah. uh for me you know a couple or three runs yeah. Then move on. So there you go. So, so that's not unusual. So the, the deck building combat system solid. Um, like it's an in, what I like is there's a bit of mix of decks construction and deck building, right? So you're doing your deck construction between fights and then your deck building while you're playing. So that was nice. I did like the gem system. I thought that was really neat. Mm -hmm. And man, you can make some really powerful cards. Like 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 the ability to combo a defensive card with an extra attack and stuff like that. Um, I like the item system finding an item and having to decide which hero to give it to was like a valid choice. Like, I'm yeah. like, Oh man, Oh, do I want to give that to him or her? And, and those were all well done. Um, the, the two com character combat system, I really liked. Like soon as I got my first missile card, I was like, Oh, that's brilliant. And it's the fact that it's a, a one cost attack that does, you know, 
12 damage, which is pretty good. But if you're in the back, it's free. It's a zero cost. And I, I like that. I, I like that positioning matter. Right. Now, the one thing I don't like or didn't like, or I, I don't even know, is <laughs> that that exploration system, right? The problem is you don't get enough ink. Even if you fight every fight on the map and you win every fight and you hit every tower and you hit every vision square, you will not reveal the entire map. And that drove me nuts. Because, like, to me, that's part of a roguelike. Like, like that's, that's where this deviates from being a roguelike. Because going back to Rogue, like, the game that these, the roguelike is named on is a game I used to play with my dad on the Amiga. We used to play the original Rogue. You always made sure to explore the entire floor before going deeper. Never go down until you've explored the entire floor. Unless you fall in a pit trap. And then you're mad because you didn't get to explore the entire floor. You might have missed out on a sword or one extra speed or a spell or some food. Oh, the food was so important in that game. And that's not the case here. And it's by design. Like they, they made the game knowing you won't explore the whole map, but I want to see the whole map. I want to collect all the stuff. Like I felt like I was being forced to fight the boss. I get it. I, I, I played the game enough. It's, this is Rogue Book. This is not Rogue. I, I guess I have to accept it. I don't like it, but it is part of what makes this game unique. Yeah, I can definitely see how when you're expecting a roguelike, the map just being revealed as you move through is something you take for granted. I mean, it's yeah. mapping mapping it out is, is what you do. <laughs> now, one thing I think everyone is going to want to know, everyone listening right now, if they haven't completely tuned out, is how does this game compare to other deck building roguelike games? Uh, the big one, the, the, the big boy everyone's talking about is Slay the Spire. Now, right now, I will say I have played a few of these. I don't have the names memorized. I tried a few different ones, mainly app-based ones. Um, I had more fun with this than any other digital deck building game of this type. Now, I'm not saying every digital deck builder. I still love Star Realms. I still like Ascension. That's a totally different thing. I'm talking about these roguelike, uh, constant progression, try to beat the boss, go up the levels kind of game. So this beats everyone I played. But I haven't played Slay the Spire. That's that's the, the the number one for most people. Now I know Sean has played it quite a bit from what I know, and I know you haven't played Rogue Book, but I think I did a pretty good job describing it that you can tell what's different. So what do you how would you compare those two games? Well, it's interesting because this game touches some aspects of Slay the Spire, uh, with the deck building, the repeated grinding, keywords, even allies in a in a way, although it, they're called powers in um yeah. in Slay the Spire. Uh, but it also goes well beyond that with party members, uh, varied upgrades, uh, rather than just the, you know, one, one possible upgrade for a card, uh, and the very concept of a dungeon with a fog of war in slay, okay. there's no movement mystery. You've got a, a path tree that, you know, from the moment you oh, start, wow. okay. um, there, there's one bad guy and you, there are four possible places you can start and a tree to get there. So you've got some choices to make, but there's no confusion. It's, it's, you're going to start here and, and go up and you know what every step along the way is from the beginning. Um, yeah, that is very different. Like, yeah. like this, you have a lot of agency over even where you explore. Do you rush to the boss? Do you go off to the left? Right. You, you hit one of those vision runes and all of a sudden an artifact shows up and it's close and you can reach it. Do you try to get to that? Um, one of the big things is just trying to find places to get you new cards. Right. And if you found one of those, then finding the gold and, and healing is sparse. If you get lucky <laughs> and find some healing, that's another one. But the I do really like the exploration, even though I hate the exploration because I want to explore everything. But that is definitely a big difference in this game. So I find it actually compares a little bit more to my personal favorite deck builder beyond Slay the Spire. And that is Monster Slayers. Okay. Um, because it actually has exploring. Um, okay. it, you don't even know where the boss is when you get in there wow. when you okay. first start. Um, it's, uh, it's not a full map. It's actually just paths, but they're all dark to you until you've mm -hmm. wandered around. Um, now they do have, there is a second character or additional characters in Monster Slayers, but you don't play them. They're just more backup. Um, okay. they're more like the allies you've got in, uh, that game. Um, and then, um, there are the unlockable upgrades for your characters between runs right. and things like that. Um, but then also you've got, um, Erratus Loader, Lord of the Dead, which really plays into that sort of the or player order and raising someone up if one, if one of your party members dies. Okay. Um, 
there's so much of that. And again, I, I, you know, pointed out before that ink is kind of the special sauce that while they've taken from so many other games, they've added this one unique to me item that, that brings it all together into its own concept. And that's the book thing as well. Yeah. The whole book thing. All right. I think that's a pretty good comparison of them from, I wish I had two codes so you could have tried it, but. Just so yeah, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, it, it really is because again, they've they've taken so many concepts yeah. from the different games. Um, I, one of the things I think that w- would be a big difference between Slay the Spire is there seems to be more thought involved in Rogue Book. Uh, Slay yeah. the one thing about Slay the Spire is the reason I'll play three three rounds of it is because for the most part it's pretty clicky. Um, yeah. I know I'm going to remove the basic attacks from my deck. I know generally, depending on which character class I'm playing, what my with my play style, which cards I'm going to add into my deck right. when they come up. Um, there aren't a lot, you know, the upgrading is literally, you know, am I going to upgrade this card or not? It's only going to yeah. go to one other thing. So it's, it's very um, quickly playable. You know, it's mm. a great lunchtime game because you can sit there eating a sandwich and, and, and clicking away. And there's a lot you can do without heavy thought. Whereas I think Roadbook, there's there's more investment and and brain power there. Yeah, even in the fights, like you're not just clicking through your decks. There's, there's a big difference. You get an icon over. So I, again, I didn't get into all the detail about the combat. But you get an icon over the enemy's head showing what they're going to do in the next turn. That's pretty. And you'll standard. even see how much damage they're going to do. Yeah, that's that's pretty so, standard. Okay, so it's it's a lot of strategy of the do I put up my defenses or do I attack, especially if they're going to buff. Right. right. So you're like, I don't need to defend this round. What do I do instead? And then trying to tailor your deck so you have that balance of defense and attack. Because that is one thing I did wrong in this game <laughs> is I ignored defense once and just went for all attack cards. And it was great till I got to the boss that was doing 60 points of damage. But like it was it was awesome until that point. Yeah. What I should have done, and this is a mistake on my part, is I should have live streamed playing this and then you could have watched and saw it right. and i didn't even think of doing that ahead of time maybe still we'll do a live stream for for those of you listening or watching let us know if you're interested in that maybe it's something i'll do at some point i do still have the game so overall i thought rogue book was a very polished solid enjoyable game while it didn't suck me into that point where i was spending hours playing through game after game and grinding it all at once i thought it was a great game that i'd pop on do a run and then go do something else and then maybe come back later that day or the next day to me it was like a break game it was a, a lunch break game though not necessarily always played at lunch now it did do a good job of scratching that deck building card game itch uh, i did enjoy the unique elements of this particular Rogue builder, roguelike deck builder uh, from the other ones I played. And it sounds like it's got even more, well, <laughs> similar to a bunch of different games kind of mm. mashed together into one. I, you can definitely see the tabletop game roots here. Uh, if you play tabletop card games, it feels like a tabletop card game. I think it's got a lot of Richard Garfield in it, especially with the different keywords and how the cards interact and how they combo. And the, there's no real rock, paper, scissors, but the whole this obviously counteracts this feel to the game. If you enjoy these kind of digital deck building games, I recommend picking up Rogue Book. Um, if you're a tabletop deck building fan, you might want to check this out, uh, especially nowadays if you're stuck at home and lock, locked down and you don't have anyone to play deck builder with. This is a probably worth noting a 100% solo experience. There is no multiplayer mode. There's no way for me to challenge Sean or fight Sean's heroes in Rogue Book. This is a solo game only. If you don't like roguelike style play, where you're going to play the same game over and over and over and start from scratch with just a little bit of an advantage over the last time, this game won't be for you. Personally, I'm glad I got to try it out. All right, well, you can check out Mo's written review of Rogue Book by heading over to tabletopbellhop.com and clicking on Reviews. And now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at games we played since last episode. All right, so this past week, a big buy to get one free toys, games, books, movies, video game sale hit Amazon, and uh, both Deanna and I were swamped trying to promote this one, so I didn't get much in-person gaming done, though I did manage to keep up with some online games. So we're going to start off with the in-person gaming, and um, what I did there was check out Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters, the creepy seller expansion with the kids, which actually the kids gave me for my birthday, so that was cool. Uh, they finally managed to get a copy after trying now for, I think, two or three years. 
uh, just bit the bullet, paid U.S. shipping, and got it sent here. So thank you for that. Now, I've already covered this great expansion in depth during the review segment. So what I wanted to do, though, is point out a couple of potential pitfalls for anyone who wants, who ends up picking up this expansion. Because our first play was, of course, an extreme one. I figured it had to be, actually, because we were like 75% of the way through the game and just rocking it. Like, th there was no way we were going to lose at this point. We're like, man, we've got, like, all the treasures. There's no haunts up. Like, this is supposed to be nightmare mode. What's going on? Well, Bellhop's rule, every first play is an extreme one. Yep. We, we, we definitely followed the rules that night <laughs> by not following the rules. So the first and biggest mistake I didn't notice until the first time we dropped off a jinxed item, which just by the luck of the draw, we didn't get till the very near the end of the game. And when we dropped it off, I wanted to make sure we did it right. So I grabbed the rule book and I looked up dropping off a jinxed item, right? And I'm like, oh, it says drop off the item and then put it in the thing. But then you get to replace a discarded secret passage. And I'm like, wait a minute discarded secret passage why would i have discarded secret passages we haven't been discarding secret passages so from the very first turn of the game literally the first move where someone rolled a four they went in through the door into a room and through a secret passage we were using secret passages like crazy like it honestly made it so easy to get around the house they were like, wow, this is such a change from the original game. This was part of when I read the rules. I thought it was going to really change the feel of the game. And it didn't as much because, well, we were moving around way too easy. Like, like it was, you could get anywhere by rolling a four, it felt like. If you got a six, it was like anywhere in the mansions, up for grabs. Well, it ends up, after you use a secret passage, you discard the secret passage. So you can only use each passage once. And to be honest, you can actually only use three of the four unless someone returns the jinxed item. So that's why things were so easy. That certainly makes a big difference. No Pac-Man board game wraparounds for you. The second mistake we made uh, was the first game we had someone escape the house while they held the jinxed item. Uh, that ends up you not only can you not carry treasure when you're jinxed you also can't leave the house uh this makes more sense i gotta say like thematically it's just like well you know yeah okay fair um i don't think though it made a difference really like that first game we won but we won so what because we cheated because we used so many secret passages so i, I don't think that had had a big impact on our first game but we made sure to create fix that problem for future games well, at least it's a uh, mistake you'll be on the lookout for the next time. And yeah, just a heads up, right? Like, like the rules aren't complicated, but just have the little things that were easy to overlook. Now, as for digital gaming, I've obviously been playing quite a bit of Rogue Book. Uh, what I didn't mention in the review is I quit. I don't play Rogue Book anymore. Um, the reason for that is there was an embargo on this one. If anyone saw me complaining about putting embargoes on reviews, this was the game that I had the embargo on. Don't do that, publishers. Why? Why would you not let me generically, organically be excited about your game on social media? Please, it's dumb. Anyway, the day the embargo dropped, which I forget what day it was. It was Thursday. It was the day after we recorded because um, they were wondering why I hadn't covered it yet. And I'm like, well, if your embargo would have been a day earlier, we would have had a live show where I would have talked about it, but you won't. So I got to wait till next week, which is now. Anyway, the day the embargo dropped, right? They're like, Thursday. They patched the game and released the official pre-release demo, which is fine. Same game. The problem is it reset everything. Everything, all the permanent progress, those skill trees I was talking about, all the unlocks I had, the levels I'd earned on my characters, the permanent, all gone back to square one. Um, to say I was annoyed would be an understatement. Um, that frustrated me enough. I haven't bothered playing the game since i will admit i booted it today just to double check a couple facts in our review like how many cards you draw at the start of your hand and stuff like that but i like i worked hard to get especially those skill tree unlocks i i was finally at the point level one wasn't a joke but like i got through level one every time and then the level two boss i i could beat now and then right i i was not interested in starting over from scratch now i do still have it installed uh, I might do a live stream so Sean can see it, uh, but it's the, it's the pre-order demo version, right? So I think what might happen is that if I might start playing if I buy the full game, 
Because at least then if I'm starting over, I can play with two different heroes and I'll have a different feel. But I don't really have any interest to play in the, the, the white woman archer and the big Hulk and Orc thing again right now from the beginning. Yeah, I mean, I guess in some ways it's not unexpected for, you know, re review copies to, yeah. to reset like that. But it is a tough uh, pill to swallow. You never want to restart a game unless it's your choice yeah. to restart the games. I mean, sometimes that happens, but yeah yeah it was a little rough and i said i was already disappointed i had the demo version i'm like i thought i was getting the full version of the game here fair enough that's it was my first time accepting a steam code from this company i i was willing to accept that but having to start scratch because whatever it's now release day yeah are they, are they gonna do the same thing in april when the full game comes out and are we gonna reset the demo thing again i don't know uh, other online plays. I, I'm probably not going to get into much detail here, but um, we've been playing a really tight game of Rallyman GT, which Sean's also in. Um, I thought we had a runaway leader. Purple was going to win. Done. Not even close. But whoever's playing purple must have pushed their luck a bit too much in one of the corners because we're starting to catch up. I got to say, that game is really enjoyable. Like, like, at least digitally. I still haven't played the physical game. And I don't know. It seems like physical game might be fiddly. I like that BGA is doing all the work in the background for us, even though it's rolling dice. And I think I'd want to roll dice. I, I'm impressed. Yeah, it really is a game that looks like it should be boring. It looks like there should be a runaway winner almost every time. And while sometimes there is, more often than not, it's a much closer race than you'd expect. And since the tracks are randomized, it's pretty much always feeling like a new game. Yeah, I, I'm digging it more than I thought I would. Uh, next, Terra Miska. That's That's been fun. I've been playing the Darklings for the first time. That's a race you have to use priests as spades, and you can't get spades any other way, but it's just one piece, priest per spade, which makes me play so different. Like, I have more houses and trading houses posts on the board than I think I've ever had, and I never even unlocked my stronghold, and I don't think I will by the end of the game. And based on the current scores, I'm in good position. The problem is if I can connect my two things, if I can get my shipping up high enough, which no one else can interfere with. So that's all me. If I can get that high enough to count, I'm, I might be in a position to win. It's going to be close. Yeah. And, and with my first play as giants, I'm doing much better than expected. And kind of proud that everyone else felt threatened <laughs> enough to lock me in on the map. Uh, I don't think I'm going to win, but it's definitely been a strong showing that I'm proud of. Nice. Uh, along with this, I'm playing other stuff on BGA. Race for the Galaxy, Seven Wonders. We've talked about those a million times. Uh, yeah, Sushi Go is the one game I'm playing the most of these days and still really enjoying it as that light online filler. Um, other than that, more masks play. Uh, we, we shifted our schedule up a little bit this week due to, uh, you know, back problems from mm -hmm. shoveling. Uh, and I learned that uh, splitting the party digitally is almost even harder to manage than it is at a normal table. So well, I'm surprised by that. I would have thought, you know, separate chat rooms or whatever. And, until until everyone gets into combat at the same time and your your one room you've got for rolling is, is getting, you know, filled uh, okay. up with a bunch of people all rolling at the same time. And and again, with you know, every time you, you roll in masks, you've got that choice. You've got a OK, so you rolled a seven to nine. So you've got to pick one of these and you rolled a twelve. Um, You've got you've got a twelve. So you get to pick three from this list mm -hmm. and, and just try to manage all that. Well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? All right. So pretty much all my plans for last week fell through. Uh, so most of what I wanted to do last week is going to move into next week. Um, I still have a large pile of games to unbox that I want to unbox. Um, had I gotten unboxings, I might have actually unboxed Creepy Seller. Though I was kind of thinking it's been out so long, who's going to care? So I, I didn't think it was going to hurt. Um, I have sat down and been reading rules. Uh, Guild Masters from Good Games Publishing is looking really good. I just don't know how well it's going to play with two. So I don't know how, how quick we'll get that reviewed, but it looks really solid. A rather interesting take on, on almost like a words of water deep. You're recruiting heroes to complete missions, but it's all very cutthroat. I don't know. It looks interesting. The cutthroat nature is where I think it's going to fall apart two players. Cause it's always going to be attack the other person, as opposed to with three players, you get that whole interplay. Um, also fully set up and ready to go to play unfair um the cutthroat version of funfair and what i think i'm going to do and, and this is my plan because i've seen other people doing it and it looks like a good idea is i think what i want to do is i want to review unfair as a standalone like just review the game and yeah i'll probably compare it a bit but then do a standalone funfair versus unfair discussion 
which that might be our two reviews next week if things go planned as well. So would, I want to have a segment out there that compares the two games as a standalone piece of content because that is what I've been seeing. Even on Twitter, you've seen the interactions on Twitter. What people want to know is how does Funfair compare to Unfair? Because, well, Unfair has been out for a while, though we will still fully reveal Unfair when we play it. I got to say, one's definitely meatier. Unfair is definitely a crunchier, heavier game. There's more economics in it. In addition to that whole, the second half of the game's more punishing and the take that nature of it. Okay. And now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Zopi, thank you. Brian Sheehan. Thanks, Brian. David Miller Jr. Thanks, David. Brian Kurtz. Happy birthday, Mr. Kurtz. Slightly belated by one day. <laughs> Yuho Rutila. Thank you. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us all over the web as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can visit our website at tabletopbellhop.com, find the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast on your podcatcher of choice, and sign up for the Tabletop Bellhop newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com for weekly updates. As always, links down below. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thanks for joining us and be sure to stick around and join us in the pedo suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.